you for joining today's webinar on communication science and online risk assessment tools. Um, as you just heard, my name is Bill Klein, and I'm the Associate Director of Behavioral Research within the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. Try to say all of that in one shot. Um, as many of you know, the NCI, or National Cancer Institute, has been in the business of developing risk tools for a very long time. And of course, Mitch Gale, one of our speakers today, is a household <laughs> name in the field given his development of the Gale model um, to predict breast cancer risk. At the same time, on the behavioral side of things, we have had a great deal of interest in risk communication over the past 10 years or so. One can see that in several meetings and special issues we've hosted on risk communication, including a 1999 JNCI monograph on this topic. The important linkage between the development of solid and predictive risk tools and the use of these tools in both clinical and non-clinical settings has become increasingly apparent over the past five to 10 years as risk tools have found their way into HMOs and web-based informational mediums. We are now in an era where anyone with internet access can log on to a risk tool and come away with a point estimate of their personal risk for a wide array of diseases and all kinds of other outcomes. As a result, it behooves us to think about the best ways to develop and present these risk tools to maximize the appropriate use of them by patients and by the public. Today we have a parade of stars lined up to address the entire spectrum from the development of risk tools all the way to how the output of these risk tools can be used and communicated in both clinical and research settings. The webinar is an outcome of a planning meeting we held last year with experts around the NCI who fall somewhere along the spectrum and we hope that there will be other outcomes of this meeting as well. In the end, we hope that work in the space will energize discussion about, our guideline or about guidelines or best practices in the use of risk tools. We're very fortunate to have a talk at the end of the day in which we'll hear about a similar exercise conducted by a group attempting to develop best practices for the development of decision aids, which are not too far afield from what we're trying to accomplish here with risk tools. So with that, let me thank Kelly Blake, Paul Hahn, and Gia Naranjo Rivera for their help in planning this webinar and the related events that I mentioned uh, earlier. And at this point, I'm going to turn the baton over to Kelly Blake to get us started. Thanks again for everyone to uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for tuning in to uh, Communication Science and Online Risk Assessment Tools. Uh, we'd like to give a special thanks to Energia Naranjo Rivera and NCI Presidential Management Fellow for her leadership and hard work um, in organizing the technical aspects of this event. Um, as Bill alluded to, with today's presentations, we hope to connect the dots between the people who design risk prediction models and the people who design the public interface of risk prediction tools. Uh, we assembled a group of very distinguished scientists from both worlds and have asked them to focus on what they consider best practices for communicating individual level disease risk and we hope that they will share lessons learned from their work and discuss core principles that they think anyone working on risk assessment tools should consider. Uh, before we get started, uh, we do want to mention that this webinar has been organized by the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at NCI, which is one of NCI's extramural funding divisions. And so for cancer communication researchers who are in the audience uh, who might be interested in pursuing cancer-related risk communication research, uh, we would encourage you to reach out to me, Kelly Blake, um, in the Health Communication and Informatics Research Branch, or Becky Ferrer in the Basic Biobehavioral and Psychological Sciences Branch to discuss ideas for grant proposals. Um, we would welcome any investigator-initiated research that evaluates online cancer risk assessment tools, as well as other types of proposals in the area of cancer risk communication, broadly writ. Um, so with that, we'll begin our first session, Cancer Risk Assessment Model Development, where, we think, where we'll have presentations by Drs. Andy Friedman and Mitch Gale. And at the conclusion of Mitch's talk, there will be time for questions before we move on. And to ask questions, you can get in the queue by dialing star one, or by clicking on the Q&A tab on your screen and, and typing your questions, and we'll try to moderate the questions as best as possible. So with that, we'll turn things over to Andy. Well, I just want to thank the, um, the organizers for inviting me. So I am also in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, and in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I hope to um, give you kind of a 30,000 foot view of the area of uh, prediction models for cancer risk and susceptibility. And um, in my talk today, 
Yeah. Trying to go to the next slide. Hold on. Okay. Can you go back up? Yep. So I'll give you a little background on uh, risk prediction models for cancer. Um, I'll put up a list of some recent models that have been developed in the last 10 to 15 years um, and ones that are being developed uh, as we speak. Um, and then I'll go over briefly some of the applications of these models um, and give some examples and uh, put up a couple questions uh, related to these applications <laughs> and to the development of and one slide on resources. Uh, we have a nice web page that I can refer you to to get more information. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so um, in 2008, I think this was Time Magazine that um, declared uh, this re retail DNA test invention of the year where everybody was spitting into a little cup and sending their DNA away and getting back from several different companies um, their risk of different types of diseases um, and uh, there, there's still a lot of question about you know, the utility of these type of, um, of tools. So, I know at least three or four companies that are, are still going strong and um, uh, pursuing this area of uh, research. But today we're really talking about um, prediction models for cancer. And um, I kind of break these up into three categories, absolute risk assessment model, and these estimate the probability of developing cancer over a defined period of time, genetic susceptibility risk model, and those estimate the likelihood of detecting a mutation in a cancer susceptibility gene in a given family or individual, and then cancer outcome risk models. And I divide these up into two prognostic, which estimate the likelihood of, of a patient outcome regardless of treatment, and predictive models uh, for cancer outcomes, and those estimate response uh, to treatment. And so today, we're, I think we're really talking about the first two, the absolute risk assessment models for prediction of cancer risk and genetic susceptibility risk models. So um, perhaps in the area of breast cancer, there may be the, the most models of, of all the other cancers. And so there's been a lot of work um, since Mitch Gale's Gale model in 1989. Um, that many people have published models that can be used for absolute risk of breast cancer, whether or not it's one year into the future, five years into the future, 10 years, or lifetime risk. Um, there's also been um, a lot of risk models in, since 1997 in the area of uh, predicting whether or not you're a carrier of BRCA1 or BRCA2. Um, and there are several models from all these publications that are commonly used in genetic counseling um, and in high-risk clinics. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of um, enthusiasm for developing risk models for colorectal cancer. There's quite a few absolute risk models for colorectal cancer. Some of those focus on advanced neoplasia. Others focus on colorectal cancer. Um, some are in different some are in different populations. And then there are several um, models that can predict whether or not you're a carrier of one of the genes for Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, which is also referred to as HMPCC. Um, there's also a, a host of other models, um, and not surprisingly, most of these models are for the common cancers, lung, um, and prostate, but there are models being developed in, in these more rare cancers as well. Um, so when you're developing a model, um, the, the models may differ depending on what information you have and, and, and what's predictive in the model. But certainly you want to consider including environmental factors, which may include demographic, reproductive factors, lifestyle factors, 
inherited factors like family history, um, clinical factors, you know, in, in, in cardiovascular disease, they certainly put in blood pressure and cholesterol, and molecular and genomic markers, which may include tumor subtypes, somatic alterations, but also um, germline genetic alterations, which kind of comes back to some of the family history as well, as well. and then interactions between all these factors. Um, in developing a prediction model, uh, there are many different study designs that can be used to develop a model. Some are off, some use several different designs that, or get data from several different types of study designs, and these include cohort and case control studies and, and nested case control studies, and some are based on expert opinion. Um, risk calculation can be rather complicated. It includes classification tree, neural network, but it could be rather simple as well, log logistic regression, empirical. So depending on the type of data, what you're trying to predict, and what you have available, you may use many of these different types of um, uh, risk calculations. Um, evaluating the model is very important. There's been a, a lot of discussion um, among, among people that develop the models on how you evaluate, uh, evaluate a model. Certainly, the, some of the keys are calibration, and that's the ability of a model to predict incidence of a disease in a group of individuals. Um, so that's in the case if you have uh, 100 people um, and you follow them over, or let's say you have 1,000 people and you follow them over five years, you can say, you know, uh, 100 of those people will develop a certain disease. Uh, it's not that easy to tell you to tell which one of those thousand are, are going to develop the disease. And that's where we get to discriminatory accuracy, which really measures a model's ability to discriminate at the individual level among those who will develop the disease and those who will not. And there's many different um, evaluation techniques for discriminatory accuracy, and um, everybody has their favorite. Um, and then certainly validating the model and whether or not it's validated within the data set that, that the model was developed um, or part of that data set or whether or not it's externally validated on a new independent sample. Um, so when you're thinking about prediction model applications, um, there are many different applications for, for prediction models and it's important to, before you develop one of these models to think about what the applications might be. Now, many of these applications um, overlap um, and certainly a model can be used for, for all of these uh, applications in some cases. In some cases, a model may be only used for a specific application. But I'm going to go through each one of these. Um, and, but before I do, I just want to introduce real briefly um, the Gale model, which, which uh, Bill mentioned before. And I'm not going to go through this because Mitch Gale will, will, will talk about the development of his model. But basically, this is a model that was based on uh, several risk factors, including age of menarche, the number of breast biopsies, age of first live birth, and depending on the relative risk estimates and the baseline hazard for a specific ethnic group, um, you can determine the risk. In this case, this is a 42-year-old white woman with different risk factors, and you can determine that her five-year risk based on these risk factors is a little bit over 1% for five years. And so I'm going to use the Gale model in, in demonstrating some of the applications that we're going to talk about. So planning intervention trials. So the Gale model was really developed specifically for eligibility criteria for um, a chemo prevention trial of tamoxifen to prevent breast cancer. And in order to get into the trial, you had to be age 35 years or older, and you had to have a Gale model risk score of 1.67% which happens to be the average risk for a 60-year-old woman. Uh, certainly, um, you can, can I go back one? So, here, so the, the uh, <coughs> go out. sorry. Uh, okay, one more. Okay. So how could it be down? Okay. Down. Sorry. Okay. So um, 
here's an analysis that was done in 2003, and it, it, it gives you an estimate of the number, the total number of U.S. women um, that would be eligible for a breast cancer chemo prevention trial based on those criteria that I just mentioned. And you can see as a woman gets older, um, her gal model score increases and she's more likely to be eligible for a chemo prevention trial, trial with a gal score of 1.67. Certainly the risk is higher among whites than in blacks and Hispanics, and that's because the baseline risk of developing breast cancer is higher among whites. Creating benefit risk models, benefit risk indices, and so these risk prediction models can also be used to incorporate in benefit risk indices. And as a result of that trial, which was positive and showed that tamoxifen actually reduced the risk of breast cancer in high-risk women, um, Mitch Gale and colleagues developed a benefit risk index, and um, basically based on, on trial data, they were able to put this calculation together where the net number of life-threatening events prevented plus half the net number of serious events prevented gave you an estimate of whether or not your benefit to harm ratio was positive or negative. And in the next slide, I, I can show you that if you, for example, had 10,000 40-year-old white women, they all, if they all had a uterus, <coughs> and together their five-year risk, each one of their five-year risks of invasive breast cancer was 2%. If they did not take um, uh, tamoxifen, you would expect 200 breast cancers. But if they did take tamoxifen, you would expect about half of those would be prevented. Um, half of the fractures would be prevented, but you would have an increase in endometrial cancer, stroke, pulmonary embolism. Um, in situ breast cancer would be prevented, but deep vein thrombosis would increase. And so based on some calculations, you come out for this specific category of a net benefit risk index of 73, which is positive. And you can do this for different cells. And so in, in this um, PowerPoint, you can see we have the Gale model score on the left side. Uh, and up, up top, we have age. And we split it up into women with a uterus and women without a uterus because endometrial cancer will be different among these women. And you can see that the categories that are in blue, the benefits will outweigh the risk of taking tamoxifen, but the red, the risk will outweigh the, the benefit. And so these, this is a very useful tool that can be used um, in a clinical situation to, to make some decisions. And it was all based really on the GAL model. Sorry, trying to go to the next slide. Okay, so estimating the population burden of disease. And uh, especially for cancer risk prediction models, it's one of the, perhaps one of the best uses of, of these types of models. And so, my, so um, a few years ago, the American Cancer Society came out with a recommendation that women with a lifetime breast cancer risk of 20% or greater should consider getting uh, MRI screening for to detect breast cancer early. And so we, we analyzed nationally representative data from the National Health Interview Survey, and we were able to calculate that, that based on these, um, based on the Gale model, that out of 80 or uh, 81 million women in the U.S. between the ages of 30 and 84, um, almost 900,000 of them would be eligible um, to undergo MRI for breast cancer screening. They all have a breast cancer risk of 20% or greater. So it gave, gives you a, 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 an indication of the, the burden of screening in this case, or burden of disease in, in other cases that these risk models can be used for. Uh, identifying individuals at, at high risk. So based on the trial results, Result of tamoxifen, the FDA actually included in their label that women who were over the age of 35 and had a GAL model score of 1.67%, uh, and this is uh, text that came right from the FDA label, could, could be considered to use tamoxifen for chemo prevention. So we can identify uh, women at high risk and that they want to consider tamoxifen for chemo prevention. And the last one is in clinical decision-making. Um, 
And uh, this is a case where I don't use the Gale model, but there's a, a new website that, that just came online. Uh, it, it came out of Stanford. And it may be hard to read here, but the, you can see the, the, uh, the URL. And this is a, a, a new tool um, that I haven't had a chance to play with, but it, it's interesting. So you can see that this is women from ages 25 to 29. All of them carry a BRCA1 mutation. And depending on whether or not they get screened with a mammogram or an MRI, at what age they undergo um, prophylactic mastectomy or ovarectomy, you can see how their risk of ovarian cancer and breast cancer and other causes of disease may change. So this is a very interesting tool, and we'll probably see more of these in the future for, for different diseases. And so just a couple considerations. Certainly in the development of a model, you, you want to figure out if you can improve the discriminatory power at the individual level with the addition of many other factors, including genetic, genetic factors. Um, can we modify existing models for different subgroups? A lot of these models are first developed in whites, and then la only later do we have data to, to see if those, those calculations um, are valid in other minority populations? And how do we effectively combine genomic, clinical, and biological risk factor information with epi factors into prediction models? So it's, a, it's always a, a question of the best way to do that. Um, when talking about application, you certainly want to consider what the strengths and limitations of your prediction model are, what, what applications are your model most useful for, and how useful are these models really at the individual level in clinical decision making for specific clinical situations. Um, evaluation, you want to make sure um, that you consider all the different criteria to assess the performance of your models, what's the best measures of discriminatory accuracy, and how transferable are your risk projections from one population to another. And today, of course, one of the key things that we're talking about is communication, and I just put up a couple couple questions, but certainly uh, many of the other um, speakers today will get into more detail. Um, how should cancer risk prediction models be disseminated to healthcare providers, patients, and the public? What's the best way to convey this risk and the uncertainty to, the, to these individuals and to these groups? And how can they be used effectively to improve cancer education and risk communication? And with that, I'll end that this is a website the NCI has developed. <laughs> Um, and if you click on risk prediction models, we have a list of all the risk prediction models that I mentioned today, and we try to update this, this um, website every three to six months. So any new models that come online that are peer reviewed, we put up on the, on the website. Um, I also put up a commentary that, um, that we put together several years ago. It has a lot of the same issues that I discussed here and a lot of good um, references that may be useful to you. And with that, I don't think we're going to take questions until after Mitch's talk, so thank you. So as we switch slides over to um, Dr. Gale, I'll just introduce him uh, briefly um, as being part of NCI's Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics and um, the godfather of the Gale model. <laughs> and again, we'll take questions uh, after this presentation. Thank you very much. I haven't been called a godfather before. But, <laughs> uh, I was asked by uh, Andy uh, to talk a little bit about how, how this model came about and, and uh, some of the developments associated with the model. Um, and uh, really it started uh, well before 1989 uh, when I had lunch with John Moldeville, who was, who was treating patients uh, in high-risk breast cancer clinic, and many people in those days would have a, a strong family history. They would assume they had an autosomal dominant disease, and they would think that they had a very high risk of breast cancer. And he didn't think it was necessarily accurate what they were thinking, and that uh, they could be informed by a more empirical approach to the problem. And so he asked me to think about it, and, um, and he became a collaborator on this paper published in 1989. Um, and it was based on the Breast Cancer Detection Demonstration Project, UCDDP, 
this was originally a project to see if you could get women to come into a screening program. It wasn't a research uh, project initially, but it was generating very useful data along the way. And, and one of the first things that came out of this was a nested case control study in these many women uh, to determine risk factors for breast cancer. Uh, but we said, you know, there's more information here because this is a cohort. You can actually learn something about absolute risk, not just relative risk, which you could learn from the case control study. And so we tried to uh, figure out what was the age-specific incidence of cancer uh, in this large cohort. And, by, uh, and, and using those data and combining it with the case control data, we could get some information on absolute risk which was what um, John Mulvihill was interested in. And uh, this is the basic approach to putting these things together. Um, uh, you get relative risks from the case control data, and you can get attributable risks from the case control data. Uh, and then uh, the question is, uh, how do we get uh, something about incidents that we can use? And uh, there's this quantity H1 star, which is the age-specific um, breast cancer rates that I talked about that you could get directly from BCDDP from a mixture of women. But what we'd like to know uh, for calculating absolute risk uh, is what would be the rate for a woman who had no risk factors, H10. And you can get that by multiplying uh, the observable H star by 1 minus the attributable risk. And this is a very nice technique because uh, in the in the BCDDP data, it allowed us to combine the um, incidence information with the, with the relative risk information to get baseline hazard. But other people, uh, including uh, me, uh, ha have used it also to combine different kinds of data because you can get the H1 star from the SEER registry, let's say, and combine that with case control data, which gives you the attributable risk. So that's a very useful little formula. And once you know the baseline hazard and the relative risk, and once you know H2, which is the risk of dying of other causes, you can compute an absolute risk. Because an absolute risk, as, as um, Andy was saying, you know, is the probability of developing a disease over a certain time interval for a person with a certain set of risk factors, X. And this, it's, I call it absolute, and other people call it crude. It's because it takes into account the fact that you might have died of something else along the way. So it, it is not what you get out of a standard Kaplan-Meier calculation. It's a, a little bit different, but it's what people are really interested in because they're not interested in the chance that they would develop breast cancer if they could never die of anything else. They're interested in the chance that they'll develop breast cancer uh, in real life. Uh, now, just I know most of the people listening uh, know the difference between relative risk and absolute risk, but just to uh, bring it home, uh, here's a 40-year-old woman who began menstruating at age 14. <clears throat> that puts her at a baseline level of risk. It doesn't elevate her risk. But she's had no children, so that increases her risk. She's had no biopsy. That's a baseline level of risk. But her mother had breast cancer. That increases her risk. If you combine all these things together using that model, you find out that her risk is 2.76 times the risk of another 40-year-old woman who has all her risk factors at baseline. So that's a relative to somebody who has no elevated factors all at baseline. And that's an interesting quantity, but it's not really what drives decision-making. What drives decision-making is absolute risk. And here's the very same woman, but we ask a different question. Not what is her risk relative to someone else, but what is the chance that she'll be diagnosed with breast cancer in the next 30 years, say? And it turns out... Uh, according to this calculation, that it's 11.6%, 0.116. This is a number that she can use in a number of applications, and, and, and uh, Andy talked about some of them, but it certainly gives a certain perspective. It's, it's nowhere near the huge number that she might have had in her head when she came into the clinic. Uh, now, uh, <coughs> the... 
the, the baseline hazard was estimated from the BC DDP data in the original model in 1989. But uh, in preparing uh, to use this model to help design the breast cancer prevention trial that, that Andy talked about, uh, it, it was decided to recalibrate this model using SEER data instead of BCDP data for the incidence rate, the specific incidence rates. And uh, this is sometimes called Gale Model 2 or the Breast Cancer Risk Assessment Tool. Uh, and it's described in a paper in JNCI by Costantino et al. in 1999. Um, uh, and, and from here on in, this is what we mean by breast cancer risk assessment tool. And uh, the, the relative risks uh, were the same, uh, but the baseline hazard has changed to reflect national steer rate instead of the people who participated in the BCB. And this model, now the first model, the original model, which we can call Gale Model 1, there was an effort to validate it in the nurse's health study. And the model gave higher predictions, E, than um, were observed. There, more cases were predicted than were observed. Um, and, uh, and this is because, uh, in my opinion, the, the time period for projection was 1976 to 1988, before people were taking annual mammographic screening. But the model was designed to, to predict people in annual screening, just like the BCDDP population was being screened. So, but, but this raises an important point. It, the, the usefulness of these models will depend a lot on the nature of surveillance of the population being um, uh, using the model. And then a little later, of course, the model has been recalibrated to national rates, but more importantly, women in the Nurses' Health Study, NHS, were being screened regularly from 1992 to 1997, and then the model was pretty close. Uh, the E over O ratio was near one. In fact, if anything, the model underpredicted slightly the number of observed um, cancers. Uh, it, 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 it worked very well in the uh, breast cancer prevention trial uh, control arm. So, so another it, uh, application in the intervention trial context, uh, Andy mentioned eligibility criteria, it also is very important in, in estimating the power of the trial because it because the average absolute risk uh, determines the number of events that will occur in the trial and that that determines the power of the trial so it's it's useful in several respects for designing intervention trials now more recently there's been additional work on the calibration how well the observed uh, uh, counts agree with what is expected from the model and the model slightly underpredicted in the period 1995 to 2002 in the AARP and PLCO cohort. But more recently uh, in the PLCO cohort, it's right back on track. But this raises the point that uh, when you develop a model like this, uh, surveillance uh, habits change, various things change. It's worthwhile keep, uh, looking from time to time to check calibration and maybe even modifying the model uh, if necessary. Now, um, Andy mentioned discriminatory accuracy, and uh, the uh, same paper by Rockhill et al. that showed good calibration in the Nurses' Health Study commented that the discriminatory accuracy, the ability to uh, decide which women will develop disease, or more precisely, to see if there's a, a, a good separation in risks between those who developed disease and those who didn't develop disease it was only modest in this model. And it's about point, in other similar studies, it's about 0.6 for the steel uh, model or breast cancer risk assessment tool. When you, when you add a, a strong risk factor like mammographic density, though, you can improve it to 0.66. Uh, and that was shown by Jinbo Chen and her collaborators. Uh, SNPs might get it from 0.6 to 0.62, uh, you know, much less than added mammographic density. But, but this is a real challenge. How can we improve the discriminatory accuracy of models like this? Um, Andy mentioned that uh, there's a need for adaptation of these models to subgroups. 
Uh, we've done work like this for African American women based on uh, the CARE study, the uh, contraceptive and reproductive experience study. So we have specific data for African American women, and now that's incorporated in the breast cancer risk assessment tool. Uh, likewise, for Asian American women, uh, Hispanic uh, women are. are uh, the, the model is still relying on absolute and attributable risk from white women, although SEER rates for Hispanic women are being have been incorporated. But more work needs to be done in that area. And so uh, here's a, a short list of research needs, some of which uh, Andy already touched on. Uh, improving discriminatory accuracy, that's an important area, uh, but a very challenging one. Uh, monitoring calibration case secular changes if these rates are occurring. If the model were perfect, you would adapt to the uh, rates, but no model is really perfect, so you have to check calibration from time to time. Um, more work on subpopulations, and uh, I think a very important uh, area of discussion is, you know, as Andy mentioned, is, is how do you use these models to improve decision making based on this. <laughs> So that's uh, really what I have to say, and uh, I think I'm within my 15 minutes. You are. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, we're going to turn it over for questions now for Dr. Gale and, and Dr. Friedman. Uh, and the way this will happen is uh, if you'd like to ask your question by telephone, you can press star 1 and get in the queue. And if you would like to do it um, uh, online using the chat feature, we'll take 10 to 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, uh, now, if you want to type your questions in, um, anything that has to do with model development for cancer risk assessment. And we have a question from the room, actually. So, Rocky, uh, <laughs> identify yourself. OK. Then. Rocky Foyer. I'm in, D in DCCPS as well. And, and this is both for, I guess, Andy and Mitch. So when, when you were going through and listing your, you know, the factors that you put into the model for the colorectal model or maybe the breast model, those factors were all related to the risk of development of colorectal cancer, but I didn't see many factors in there related to the risk of other cause death, which Mitch called H2. And you would think that things that maybe could be related to colorectal cancer but also could be related to all kinds of other factors might be important and could be added to these models to improve their, 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 their predictive ability. So maybe you want to comment on, either one of you, on the, the need to, to, to incorporate those kind of factors related to H2, I guess. Should I just, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, H2, uh, I, I had a little formula there, and if you, if you study it closely, you realize that the, uh, it, it has a kind of secondary effect on absolute risk predictions. It's important, but it is not nearly so important as H1, uh, the, uh, the risk of the disease of interest. So uh, 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 in principle, uh, get modeling uh, the risk of mortality from competing causes can have a small impact on the absolute risk projections and might be worthwhile in certain circumstances. For example, if you're modeling the risk of dying of a cancer that you've just been diagnosed with, uh, where the hazards of, of dying of other causes are quite appreciable in a short time period as well, uh, you, you, uh, it might be very worthwhile in that setting. In the prevention setting, um, when uh, uh, we've done sensitivity analyses to see whether modifications of H2 had much impact on the absolute risk of the disease of interest, uh, we found that the uh, effects were very, uh, quite small. And, and if you look at the formulas, you, you see that it's, it's going to be a second order, especially if H1 and H2 are, ki are kind of small, as in the prevention setting. I guess especially when it's not people younger than, say, 60 or 70 years old. Yeah. Now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, if you ha if you have a, a person who is uh, is quite sick and uh, and wanted to make a, a, a ten year projection of her chance of getting breast cancer, uh, you want to take that into account. I think uh, yeah. the standard uh, uh, standard projection would not be right. And, but of course, uh, I, I think many physicians could do that in their head. <laughs> 
they wouldn't be too concerned about breast cancer if she was very sick. Right. Okay. Okay, I don't see any questions yet from the chat. We were trying to put one in. Um, so, Brad, we're going to turn it over to the operator to um, allow any questions to come in. Once again, if you have a question at this time, please press star then one. Please stand by for any questions. Currently, we have none. Hi, this is Gia Rivera. I'm a fellow at the NCI, and I'm doing some back-end work uh, to make this conference happen, but I actually have a question. Um, and so I'm very interested in health disparities, and I, I happen to be a Latina, and um, I see that there has not been a lot of work done um, in the realm of uh, working with Hispan developing these models for Hispanics. I'm, I'm wondering if there are specific funding opportunities that are encouraging that type of activity, um, or the development of models in the field, and if there are any notable differences that you're aware of, either within that or other um, ethnically different populations from, a, from the Caucasian demographic. Uh, you know, I can't speak to the uh, funding opportunities, <laughs> uh, because I'm in an intramural division, Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, but I am aware of some interesting research going on in this area. Um, and. Um, a paper was recently published by uh, Mateo uh, Bonegas, who uh, it was doing his thesis work at um, Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center, uh, trying to see how well the standard models that we have in BCRAT work in Latina populations. And now there's a he's trying to develop a consortial effort to find, to, to, to get the case control data that would be really necessary to make a Latina specific model. So uh, pulling the, the primary data sources together is a real challenge. I think, And I think the first effort is going to be to try to pull the data together from various uh, sources throughout the country. But uh, I, I don't know if there's a specific initiative um, or uh, funding opportunity uh, that supports that. Um, yeah, so so really, you know, when, when I worked with Mitch Gale and Ruth Pfeiffer to develop the colorectal cancer, the NCI colorectal cancer risk assessment model, wanted to do a model for Hispanics and other um, ethnicities, but the data were really not available. And I think, um, you know, we're at a different point now, and there are a lot of studies out there, and they're forming consortium to, to pool their data. So. And I think that um, a, a lot of these studies in uh, minority populations are getting better scores and are at better chance for funding um, since there is such a great interest in health disparities. So I think as time goes on, we'll, we'll have those data. And just, you know, you saw how the Gale model now has one for African Americans and one for um, Asians um, that, uh, you know, Team will, will have one for Hispanics, hopefully, as well as the data becomes valid. But uh, I think uh, uh, just one other comment along these lines. Uh, it might be possible to uh, think of fundamental research on uh, etiology and form, <coughs> whenever you form a, a really uh, a, an important case control study, it can have multiple uh, implications. Uh, learning about the basic etiology of disease as well as forming the foundation for models of this type. So uh, there can be many uh, uh, parties that would be interested in, and the, the key is to get a good study in those populations, which can have many spin-offs, including risk projection. Great. So we have a question um, that's coming up from our chat room. We'll try to go in order. Uh, Borsika Rabin, who is in Denver, is asking if we currently have a similar listing of prediction models for prognosis as the one we have for cancer risk. So we do not, but we're working on it right now. So thank you for the question. Good idea. Uh, prognosis, there's a lot of models out there for prognosis and, and, and uh, outcomes as well, but um, uh, we're working on it. Can I interrupt there, please, Andy? Um, 
you actually missed a bunch of models in the list that you included for absolute risk prediction. This is Graham Colditz. I'm aware of peer-reviewed publications by Dr. Rosner for breast, ovary, colon, and melanoma. You didn't include any of them in your absolute risk prediction modeling list. So I, I didn't list out the ones for other than breast. So if I, if I miss Bernie's model, I apologize in the list of absolute risk models for breast, but I didn't risk, I didn't uh, spell out the ones for ovary or, um, or other than breast. But you, you had a list of colon models and you didn't include his model there either. Oh, okay. Well, Esther I'm Way is first author in an American Journal of Epidemiology paper. Um, that you seem to miss as well. Okay, well, we will certainly add those. Thanks, Graham. So I'm going to take another question here uh, and, and try to read it as best I can. Um, this comes from Azor uh, asking, about the Asian, Asian women breast cancer prediction model, was it based on data among Asian American women who were born and raised in the U.S., or was it done among Asian women immigrants, and was acculturation factor that were acculturation factors considered in the model? It, it was done um, on Asian American women uh, living in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but the um, uh, acculturation w was not uh, used as a specific risk factor in the modeling, um, uh, it, but, but uh, that same study had shown uh, that there are acculturation effects uh, and that if you um, uh, uh, look at women uh, who have been here longer and, uh, have a, and, and whose uh, relatives have been here longer, uh, their, their risk tended to be higher than other women. But uh, the reason that we uh, didn't need to, to take acculturation into account uh, to that extent is that these uh, projections were standardized to SEER rates in uh, African American women, and the case control data were used as to estimate relative risk from the factors that are, are in the standard breast cancer risk assessment tool model. So acculturation was taken into account implicitly by the use of SEER rates. So one more question uh, uh, asked, can you briefly mention how the models for subpopulation would differ or the challenges for developing models for subpopulation? Um, and perhaps the person who asked that, if you need to elaborate, you could dial star one. Well, uh, the, <laughs> I take as a starting point that, um, you know, we, one hopes that relative risk from one population would uh, translate to, into ver uh, and would work in various regions for that same uh, racial subgroup. One hopes that they, that they, that the relative risk would be fairly invariant even across a racial and ethnic subgroups, but but the uh, but one needs to look to see if that basic position is is valid, and and one needs to modify relative risk and attributable risk uh, when it's not uh, valid. The the thing that would tend not to be uh, very translatable from one ethnic or a racial group to another would be the, the absolute rates themselves because many factors can influence uh, the, the, the absolute rate, whereas some of the relative risks tend to be uh, more conserved across racial and, and ethnic groups. But nonetheless, the real challenge is finding the good uh, basic uh, either cohort or case control data uh, for the various ethnic groups. Uh, once, you've, once you have a good study there, you, you can become much more specific um, in your estimates of relative risk and attributable risk and then apply uh, nationwide uh, registry data uh, t together with those case control data to, to, to come up with a, a reasonable estimate of risk model. But, it, it, but it, it, there is a need for good studies uh, 
in subgroups. So we have one more question, uh, perhaps for Andy, and it is, um, or Mitch, what other risk prediction models is NCI working on? Or maybe Rocky has the answer to that as well. I know there's the melanoma tool going up, right? That's Amy Berrigan. Um, I think Mitch might know better um, <clears throat> about the models that are in development. I know Rocky has one that's not in, on risk. <coughs> so we're just, yeah, go ahead and talk about the risk models, and then I can talk about our uh, uh I know that Rick Pfeiffer is doing some work on um, uh, endometrial cancer right now. And uh, I, I, I know that there are other applications of absolute risk ideas, um, for example, in populations exposed to HPV for developing cervical cancer or, or cervical neoplasia. Uh, uh, from Kotke in, in Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics is working on models like that. Uh, uh, those are the two primary areas that I'm familiar with. And, and we're working on a, a prognostic model for case for cases of cancer survival and using the fear data. And it was interesting, Andrew, that you discriminated between models that are for predicting risk as a function of treatment versus just general general prognostic <coughs> models. And we're working on the general prognostic model using SEER data as our base for what we're what we're utilizing. And we're that's gonna be we're trying to planning thinking about deploying that in clinical settings and uh, we've developed that for prostate and colorectal cancer. Oh so, so this is a model that once somebody is diagnosed, it, pre it, pre it predicts their survival from cancer as a function of the stage of disease, um, any, other, any other important factors, for, for example, Gleason score in, in prostate cancer, and then also takes into account um, uh, other cause death like comorbidities, which should become increasingly important in this setting, where it's interesting to, to notice that in the, in the, the risk prediction models, were, were, are not quite as important. Thank you, Rocky. So we're going to move on now to session two of the webinar, uh, uh, which is about communicating risk effectively. We are very lucky to have Dr. Brian Zygmunt Fisher with us today, uh, tuning in from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. And his talk is entitled, Making Risk Calculator Outputs Meaningful for Patients. So, Brian, you should be able to get to the up and down arrows on your screen, and we'll let you take over. Great. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak with everyone today. I want to start by setting the stage and having us all imagine who a potential risk calculator user might be. So, for example, let's imagine for the moment Robert, and Robert might be, say, a middle-aged man. He's you know, concerned about making sure that he does what he needs to do to stay healthy, and he's concerned about various diseases. So maybe he's concerned today about heart disease, and tomorrow he's going to be interested in doing something similar for prostate cancer or for colorectal cancer. But he goes to one of the many online calculators that have become available using some of the models that we've just heard about and enters whatever the appropriate risk factor information might be. In this case, it might be blood pressure, height, cholesterol, and a prostate cancer one, you might have family history, age, etc. And then he gets his result back. In this case, his result says, you know, your 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease is 14.52%. So then he goes home, and he's talking with some friends, and he says, you know, they ask him, what did he do today? And he says, well, you know, I went and I used this, this risk calculator, and it told me what my risk was. <coughs> Fused because he doesn't yet know whether or not he's high risk or not. And I think the, the key question here is, what does it mean for Robert to be informed about his disease risk, whether that be his cardiovascular risk or prostate cancer risk or whatever? What does it take to make the output of a risk calculator mean something important to the end user? And that's what I want to mostly talk about today. So I think there's a couple problems with Robert's tale. 
The first one is a, is a topic that I and several of my colleagues uh, recently published a paper on, which is this question of precision. And one thing you'll note is he got a very detailed piece of information. He learned 14.52%. Does it matter that it had 14.52% or could we use just have said 14%? And so I and my colleagues, Holly Whitteman and some other people, did a hypothetical study in which we created a hypothetical risk calculator. You see it here, um, or one of the pages from it. In this case, we were doing something on kidney cancer, not because we thought many people knew a lot about kidney cancer, but precisely because most people don't have an association about how likely they are to develop cancer related to kidneys. It's not like breast or prostate. But what we did was we assigned people in this hypothetical study a specific result. And you can see here, all the results rounded up to 2% or rounded down to 2%. But we gave systematically different levels of precision to different people. Some people got 1.867% as their risk. Other people got 1.9%. Other people got 2%. We wanted to see what would happen. How would people's responses to the what is ultimately is the same core information differ based upon the level of precision that was provided. The first thing that we found is it actually does affect the believability of the information. When we asked our participants how believable is this number, what we see is a small but significant effect that integers are perceived as more believable. Second, people's ability to recall their number, to remember <laughs> what it was, appears to drop off with any number of decimal places beyond integers. So and we, we allowed for even approximate recall, plus or minus 50%. And what we see here is that the people who received integer information were more likely to be able to recall that information five, ten minutes later than people who even just got one decimal point or two or three. So that's one problem. Another problem is, what did, they, what did Robert get? He got a number, a single number. And he got it as a percentage. Now, there is an ongoing conversation, I would say, an ongoing debate regarding whether or not it's more helpful for people to receive risk information, numerical risk information, in the context of percentages, for example, 12%, versus frequencies, 12 out of 100. Um, there's arguments been made that frequencies result in more consistent risk perceptions, particularly amongst less numerate people, people for whom number skills are not as strong or they're, they're not as comfortable using numbers. And yet there's also been recent uh, work, for example, by Willotion and Schwartz, that suggested that the simplicity of a percentage may in fact result in better knowledge. And, and I can see the argument both ways, and I don't want to take sides in this debate. But I do want to say that there are some other formats that we do want to avoid. And one in particular is what I would call, and what others have called, the one in N format. To say one in 250 or one in 375. The problem here is that when you vary the denominator in a ratio, it makes it very difficult for people to make comparisons between risks. And ultimately, we can, as I'll talk about in a little bit, we don't just care about what one number is. We care about how one risk fits into the large set of risks that a patient might face. And multiple papers are now arguing, based upon some very clear experimental evidence, that in fact presenting information in a one in n format is, is, results in considerably worse understanding and less ability to use that information than things like per frequencies or percentages. But whichever way you do it, I think another one of the most basic principles of risk communication is to make sure that we can acknowledge the two sides of a risk statistic. The true meaning of a risk statistic includes both the risk of an occurrence and the risk of a non-occurrence, the complement of that ratio. And risk calculators, by their very nature, tend to focus people's attention on the numerator, the occurrence risk, whether it be five out of a thousand women will experience one particular complication or 12 out of 100 men will experience prostate cancer or whatever that calculator output might be, it focuses the attention on the occurrence. And yet we also need to remind people 
of the equivalent risk of non-occurrence. That even if 12 people, 12 men out of 100 might develop prostate cancer, 88 out of those 100 will not. Now, much of my work and many of the others, some of whom are on this call, have been involved with thinking about how do we make risk more visually meaningful to people. And so I'm an advocate for icon arrays, or what we often call as pictographs. You see here an example of a icon array display used in the context of communicating to a woman who is considering breast cancer chemo prevention to help that woman understand just how likely her risk of developing breast cancer might be. This was an application that, in fact, built upon the Gale model we heard about earlier. <clears throat> I think there's some clear evidence, and I'll show some citations in a moment, that icon arrays are often better graphics. And, and there's a couple specific reasons for that. One is that non-events are equally as salient as events are, right? You can look here and you can see the whole population of the 100 people represented in a percentage. And you see the 10 that are colored in there, the 10.3, I think it was, that represent the risk. But you also see the 89.7 that are not colored, that are colored that background gray to represent that that person is not experiencing the event. I also note that this visual display enables people to recognize the risk magnitude using multiple different visual cues. You can count them up directly, and you can see there's 10 there across that first row. You can look with a sense of relative area, so you still have the same visual cue that you would have, say, in a pie chart, as well as you have the height, just as you would in a bar chart. But don't just take my word on it. Here, here are just some of the percent of the publications that have come out recently in a variety of contexts that look at the use of icon arrays in a variety of risk communication contexts and show pretty clearly that icon arrays can particularly help the less numerate to understand risk statistics, <coughs> that they can help clarify the, the population out of which a risk is applied, so ignorance of are we talking about a small population or a large population, that they can reduce side effect aversion in the context of communicating about side effects. And some of my own work has looked at the clarification of incremental risk, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that in a little bit. And just to be clear, obviously not everyone has the opportunity to have a graphic designer working for them. One of the things that we're doing here at the University of Michigan is building an online tool for researchers and potentially clinicians or other people who are interested in using this type of display to be able to have quick access to presentation quality graphics of whatever tailored format you need them to be for your particular purpose. This is an earlier version you see here. We hope to have a newer version coming out sometime later this year. Of course, there's a third problem with Robert's tale, and that is, ultimately, Robert didn't get what he wanted. Robert wanted to know if he was high risk. And at the end of the day, when he was done looking at his risk calculator, he didn't have the answer to that question. Robert wanted to know he was a high, whether or not he was somebody who has a high risk. And that's what I might call a categorical possibility statement. He wanted to know which category he fell into. Is he average risk? Is he high risk? Is he low risk? Is he borderline? Because those categories have some intrinsic meaning for him as he's trying to figure out what he needs <coughs> to help himself prevent disease down the future to stay healthy. What he got was a risk communication, a perfectly accurate one, an absolute probability statement that said his risk is this. And the mismatch between that purpose and that information led him to still be confused even after he got the risk calculator output. So what could we do for Robert? Well, one thing we can do for Robert is we can give him a category, a label. We can classify those numbers. Is that 12 risk or that 14% risk a high risk or not? Now, there's some advantages to that because it answers his question. But I do want to point out that that sometimes there can be some drawbacks to that. Because there is some research, I published one paper on this a, a few years ago, that shows that when you present risk statistics and evaluative category labels at the same time, people learn 
they remember those labels. They remember that they're high risk, but they do not necessarily remember what the numbers were. And sometimes that's going to be a problem because sometimes the types of uses we want people to have for a risk calculator output involves not just knowing that they're at high risk, but the degree of risk and being able to think about how much will their risk change if they do certain types of things. So let me put this into greater context here. Right? Let's imagine that you went to, let's say, a, a Gale model-based risk calculator, and you are a woman, and you went to this model, and you, you, you entered your information, and you, it told you that your five-year risk of breast cancer was 6%. Now, whatever you might think about that 6% number, what if I also told you that the average woman's risk is 3%? In other words, you would now be able to figure out that you have a higher than average risk. Or instead, I told you that your average woman's risk was 12%. In other words, that you have a lower than average risk. Notice, I'm not changing what your risk is here. I'm just changing what the context is. And we've done this. We did a, a hypothetical study in which we did this type of manipulation a few years ago. Angie Fagelin um, was the, the lead author on it. And as you see from these results, simply changing the context into which that 6% personal risk was put fundamentally changed many different attitudes about potential interventions. So this was done in the context of something like tamoxifen, you know, although we did not call it that, a pill that would cut breast cancer risk by half. And we see here that people who were told, given that extra contact information, so that they felt that they were above average risk, not only were they more likely to take the pill and more worried about breast cancer, but they simply perceived that reduction in risk to be more significant, that cutting the 6% to 3% was more important to them, more significant somehow, by the fact that they were above average as opposed to being below average. The point here is that our risk perceptions are not purely absolute. They're defined in part by the relative context into which we put any given number. And what that means is that we have to think very hard about what is the context that we give people. Right. What we're talking about is comparative probability information, not only being able to say, my risk is this, but also being able to say, my risk is this, which is higher than other people's risk, which is that, or lower than, or equal to. The fundamental point here is what the term of art in the decision psychology literature and the marketing literature is called information evaluability. And really, the fundamental point here is information evaluability is the difference between what a number is, what a number means to the person who gets it. And what I've been alluding to here is the idea that a meaning of a number, whether it be a risk number or, frankly, any other kind of health information, depends upon whether you evaluate it by itself or whether you have the opportunity to compare it to other statistics. And note that statements like high risk are inherently evaluable. I don't need to compare it to anything else to know that high risk means I'm in a worse situation than the low risk person is. But that 14% risk, Robert needed some context in order to know whether he was at high risk and to be able to attach that meaning to it. Now, information evaluability is actually very important for decision making because easy to evaluate data have those intrinsic meanings, which means that they can always be used in decision making. People will always incorporate that type of information into their choices. Hard to evaluate data, however, are generally ignored unless people have either background knowledge or other types of comparative information that makes that information more able to be understood, easier for them to derive that intrinsic cognitive meaning and emotional meaning. What this suggests from a communication design standpoint is that we, as risk communicators, need to be very careful and purposeful about the way in which we use contextual information. If we choose to provide context, such as, for example, the average woman's risk of developing cancer, at the same time as we are telling 
an individual woman what her risk of developing breast cancer is. We are likely to evoke feelings in that woman of being at risk or of being safe. At the same time as we evoke those strong feelings, however, we run the risk that that woman may lose a sense of her absolute likelihood and only remember and only base her decisions upon those emotional responses. Now, I note here a snapshot of the breast cancer risk assessment tool. And this puts the woman's risk right next to the average woman's risk of someone her age. That's fine, because this will make it absolutely clear to her that she is above average risk. On the other hand, I'm not sure how likely it is that she will remember that her risk is around 2.5%. <coughs> if that matters in a particular context, if it matters that it's 2.5 and not 4 or not 1, that may inhibit her ability to remember that difference. By contrast, of course, we could just not provide that context. That will try and evoke in the, the recipient some form of absolute risk belief. But of course, without that context, this is hard to evaluate. So the woman who receives that type of information may not be able to fit her breast cancer risk into any other sense. She may not know whether that's the most, the largest cancer risk that she faces or not, because she has no basis on which to make that type of comparison. But sometimes we might want to do this, because there are some times in which we want people to act on risks, even if they're below average just simply because the magnitude of that risk at an absolute level is worthy of intervention. <clears throat> so, of course, going back to Robert, Robert could have known his risk better. If the risk calculator hadn't just given him his number, they had provided other types of numbers for context to make his number easier to evaluate. But, of course, the subtext here is what that meaning would be depends a lot on what other comparative numbers we chose to provide. We could, have make his, we could have made his number look large or small, depending on what we chose to provide. I do want to spend a couple more minutes talking about an issue that arises when you start to embed these types of risk information into decision support systems. And I'll talk specifically in the context of one that I'm more familiar with related to breast cancer treatment decision making. You know, when you embed a risk calculator or a prognostic model, as we've talked about, into a decision support system, there's an inherent context there. You know why it is you're getting that risk information. You're trying to inform a particular decision. And so it's somewhat easier to improve the evaluability of that number. However, there is a potential disadvantage, and that is the potential for information overload. And I'll give you an example by drawing a comparison to one of the tools that is commonly used to help women who are diagnosed with breast cancer think about their potential treatment options which is Adjuvant Online. This is a screenshot of Adjuvant Online. You can see there's a lot of different things that you can change here. This is, a, by the way, a clinician tool for estimating prognostic information with no additional therapy after a woman has had breast cancer surgery, or whether after that woman has had hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, or both of those therapies. By the way, I mentioned this as a clinician-based tool, but it's not as though this type of information never gets into the patient's hands. In fact, Adjuvant has a patient handout, which you now see here, captures much of the same complexity of information. But this is a handout that a patient might be given to think about as she's making her adjuvant therapy choice. The point I want to make now, however, is the idea that there's an awful lot going on there. And in fact, there's some good work by Ellen Peters and, and others uh, on this idea that less can sometimes be more, that sometimes improving, including less information in a, in a variety of contexts, and risk communication being one of them, can improve not only choice, but comprehension of the decision-critical information. And this, by the way, appears to be particularly true for those people with lower numeracy skills. So what does this mean for practice? Well, one thing I think it needs for practice is what I'll call one-at-a-time decisions instead of all-at-once decisions. If you look at the adjuvant tool, or as in here, a variant of what the adjuvant display might look like if we transform those horizontal <coughs> bars into the icon array format that I was showing you earlier, you've got a lot going on here. You've got four different treatment options that could be considered. And even within a given treatment choice, you've got 
multiple different outcomes being considered. So if I look at this, I might I have to figure out, well, sure, there's a larger benefit if I do chemotherapy and hormonal therapy both, but just how much benefit do I get from adding chemotherapy on top of hormonal therapy? I've got to do some mental math to figure that out. On the other hand, if you break these into two binary choices, the one on the left being, do you want to have hormonal therapy, yes or no? And you can look here and you see that with hormonal therapy, nine more women out of 100 are alive because of that therapy. Once you say, yes, this is something I want to do, you can then take those, that, those nine women and incorporate them into the baseline. You'll notice that the baseline, the green squares here, change from 58 to 67, adding those nine in. So that when you get to the second decision, you can now look specifically at the incremental effect of adding chemotherapy onto hormonal therapy. And when we did a study, again, a hypothetical study, but one with women of an age where they might be facing this decision in their future, what we found is that for higher numerate women, it doesn't really matter that much. But for less numerate women, they were unable to pay attention to the magnitude of the benefit of chemotherapy when all the options were being presented at once. Only when we broke it down into this incremental decision framework were the less numerate women able to recognize that a 5% benefit from adding chemotherapy really is larger than a 1% benefit from adding chemotherapy. But another thing you can also do here is redu remove redundant information. You'll notice that all of the th graphics that I've shown you thus far showed multiple different outcomes, survival as well as mortality. Look here, on the left you've got four colors to try and parse. On the right you've got exactly the same information being represented in two. Right, because the mortality risk is just complicated. <coughs> now, sometimes it may be important to know what proportion of women die from cancer versus die from other causes, but I suspect in many contexts what people really care about is, am I going to have the most likelihood of being alive? The graphic can be more powerful simply because it's easier for people to understand. And if I can just allude to Dr. Friedman's talk, I know that the BRCA, the BRCA tool that <coughs> had many, many different outcomes being represented all at once. While that represents a lot of very useful information, it's also a lot for somebody to process. And thus it may, in fact, be more difficult for somebody, a less numerate person in particular, to figure out what to take away from that graphic than a smaller, more simple one that removes that type of redundant information. But let me go back to Robert to close this. You know, the main question here is how can we help patients like Robert know their risk better? but know in the larger sense of knowing, knowing what to do about them. <clears throat> I think the fundamental point here is that patients really do have varying needs for risk data, that not all risk communications are the same. Sometimes very simple risk concepts like being at high risk is all we really need to do to communicate to somebody in order to motivate behavior. And yet at other times, patients really do require detailed risk estimates in order to inform complex decisions. Like, how much of a difference can I make to my risk if I undergo a protective, you know, a protective action like taking tamoxifen to try and prevent breast cancer? How does this risk compare to other risks that I face? Those are the types of questions that are often very relevant in a decision support context. And in those types of contexts, that precision of information is necessary, but we need to make it very clear how it's useful in order for people to be able to use it effectively. So fundamentally, my recommendation is this. Different applications of risk calculators require us to consider using different risk formats. And then in the development of risk calculators for patient use, for clinician use, we need to make some very conscious choices regarding when do we want to be giving numbers, when do we want to be giving labels. When do we need to provide contextual data? And if we do, which form of contextual data will be most conducive to helping that person really understand what they need to know in the context of the decision they're making at that moment? And we need to think, consider both numerical and graphical formats, <coughs> verify risk that make it intuitively meaningful so that the risk number becomes something that really is part of that individual's decision and not just something they sort of nod their head at and then make their decision based upon other factors. Because ultimately, I think the point is this, and I put a little cartoon up here that I think that captures it. The point is that simply 
giving patients the right number, the right output of the risk calculator, is not always the same thing as providing meaningful answers to them as they go through the process of trying to make complex medical decisions. And that would be it for me, and I'm open to taking some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so I think, Brad, uh, the operator, if you're on the line, let's go ahead and take some voice questions first while we wait for any of our typed questions in the chat room to come up. Uh, sure. Certainly. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star then one on your phone's keypad. Once again, please press star one if you have a question on the phone. I thought, I thought that was a very uh, interesting talk, uh, and um, I particularly liked your uh, idea that you have to differentiate the kinds of risk information for different uh, sorts of applications. Some of them require very fine-grained uh, information because you're uh, trying to make a quantitative uh, uh, assessment of whether one risk uh, outweighs another risk, or uh, and, and but, but other people might not have <laughs> that level of detail, and in fact, it might put them off. So, but if you have the fine level of detail, you can always go to the coarser level. You can't go backwards, and um, of course, you could present in one uh, setting several levels of detail, and I just wonder. Uh, for a general purpose tool, an online tool, uh, where you might, uh, on the one hand, have physicians trying to decide whether to take a statin, uh, prescribe a statin, uh, or you might, on the other hand, have somebody just trying to figure out whether he or she should um, uh, live a healthier lifestyle. Uh, in that context, where you have so many potential users, uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on the ability to sorry, present several levels of detail? I do, and, and I want to start out by pointing out that while it's certainly true that one can take more finer level detail and aggregate it upward, it is precisely that task which less numerate people find so difficult, that they are not comfortable with dealing with, for example, large tables of information or m many different types of numbers all at once. And so even though a highly numerate person might be able to aggregate it up and get the gist, a less numerate person is going to have particular trouble with that process. So my general approach would be to suggest doing the opposite, to start with the course information but enable the more numerate person or the person who needs that more greater detail for a specific purpose to then be able to access that intentionally. The idea being here that once a, if I already know that I'm at high risk, but I really want to know exactly how much risk because it, let's say I need to trade it off against another one, I now have the motivation to take that extra step to go and find out exactly what that number is or to put it into a larger context. And so I would advocate for, I guess, two principles in terms of the design of tools. One is to recognize that it's actually relatively rare that one tool can meet multiple needs equally well. And that we may need to think about designing, let's say, a website that may take the same core model but package it slightly differently for different purposes. Because the process of translating that calculator output into the output that the patient needs or the clinician needs for their particular decision is not the same in different kinds of contexts. But also I would advocate for sort of a tiered structure that we start by having the default of saying we need to be as simple as possible and then recognize that there will be some users and some contexts in which more detail is necessary and that by enabling those users to click into an extra link or get an extra fact sheet or whatever the appropriate type of information context would be, they can then get that more detailed information as they need it 
but it doesn't end up distorting or potentially undermining the comprehension of people who neither want it nor need it. Thanks, Brian. So I'm going to take a question from Ronald Myers, who has typed in, and he says, uh, what does research tell us about differences in response to risk information by race, ethnicity, separate from socioeconomic status and health literacy? Kind of a muddled answer for that question, unfortunately. Um, there has been some research that has suggested that there may be a white male effect uh, in certain contexts that um, white males appear to see certain types of risks as <coughs> earning than either white females or ethnic minorities. I am not personally that convinced by it because I'm not sure we can disentangle some of the other effects that you mentioned. Um, and quite honestly, I think also, I am of the belief, and, this, and certainly some of my, uh, the research that I'm familiar with suggests that, that our risk perceptions are very contextually dependent. And how we ask questions changes how we answer them. And as I talked about earlier, the context into which we put risk information can change very dramatically how I feel about it. And so I'm really not convinced necessarily that some of the potentially racial or, or even gender effects that we see are, are actually something that's permanent as much as potentially something that's evoked by the particular context in which they were originally measured. Thank you. This is Rocky Floyer again from Division of Cancer Control and Population Science at SOAK. I'm the person who derived the one in eight lifetime risk of breast cancer number but I actually don't like that number for a, lot, a couple of different reasons. One that I think you alluded to is the changing denominator. So as much as I tell people 12 point something percent, they seem to love one in eight. The other reason I don't like that number is because it's a lifetime risk. And I feel that from a point of view of usable information, having such a long horizon is, is maybe less useful. So maybe you could comment especially about the latter point that, that um, for risk prediction models, is there some maybe some limit maybe beyond 10 years that I don't know if you've done any research to think that risks, longer term risks than that become really very le much less useful for, for people? Well, let me start by saying useful for what? Because I think the answer to your question really depends upon the purpose that we're talking about here. Right? If we're simply talking about motivating people to pay attention to the reality of the breast cancer risk that they face, a one in eight number, a lifetime risk number, is the largest number that's an accurate representation of that risk. Now, as you say, it's not necessarily very useful because that aggregates everything, including what might happen to that woman when she's 75 or 80, which is very different from an emotional standpoint, I think, than, than what, uh, say, a 45-year-old woman might be feeling. Um, if you want to talk about motivation in the sense of, of my Robert's sense of wanting to know, am I high risk, then I'm not sure lifetime risk numbers are problematic. If you want to talk about being able to make trade-offs on risk, to being able to make really complex weighting of the magnitude of just how likely is this to occur, then I agree with you. I think a lifetime risk is, is really not very helpful precisely because we don't really know how long we're going to live, and that uncertainty makes it very difficult <laughs> to put that number into context. Um, I, I do think you raise a very important point, which I did not bring up, which is when you are talking about a risk number, the time period is absolutely essential. Right? I can easily double your risk of something by simply doubling the time period in which that, that risk is being assessed. And there is work, and I've done some of this work, that suggests that people are very bad at paying attention to the time interval being discussed. We look at a number for a five-year risk. We look at a number for a 15-year risk. And the 15-year number looks a lot bigger, so we get a lot more worried about it. And I'm not sure there's a clear answer as to how to fix this problem, as much as to do as best we can, make it very, very clear how long the interval is that we're talking about. And perhaps consider that we need to be presenting 
multiple time intervals in order for somebody to truly understand what their risk is. Right? You can imagine a woman who's trying to understand her breast cancer risk, putting that 12 out of 100 lifetime risk next to the five-year risk <laughs> out of a Gale model calculator and saying these are really, in one sense, the same thing. It's just there over a different time period. And depending upon what your purpose is, one might be more important for you than another. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to read you the next question from Dr. Sylvia Cho, uh, which she asks, um, she says that much of the work in risk communication assumes that being more informed and knowing more is better for a variety of reasons. Your presentation shows us that more is often not better, and instead it can create confusion and decrease the motivation for one to choose health-promoting behavior. Would it be helpful for, for us to differentiate or identify the various target outcomes of each of our risk communication tools, or the online ones included? For example, is it to simply inform someone about their risk, motivate a healthy behavior, talk to a provider, alleviate fear and stress, that sort of thing? Would it be helpful to identify those target outcomes? I would say almost anyone in any form of communications design would argue that it is almost always important to have a clear sense as to what the purpose of a communication is when thinking about designing the format in which that information is going to be presented. Absolutely. I think it is quite important for us to recognize that some audiences are looking to be informed. Other audiences may, the purpose may really be to convince them that this you are at high risk, therefore you need to be motivated to take action. And that the format in which we present information quite appropriately should be different in one versus the other context. Um, as to the point about sort of less and more, I don't actually see my messages being that less is always better. I see, my point is that we need to strip off unessential elements and recognize that the, the core of our message is what we need to focus people's attention on. If the core of the message to Robert is, look, you are at high risk, you need to do something about this, then anything that does not support that specific belief has the potential to distract him and hence the potential to, to undermine the message. If, on the other hand, we're talking about a woman who is looking at adjuvant therapy decision making and is really wrestling with the very difficult, value-laden trade-off decision of is extra chemotherapy and all of the side effects that will come with that worth, say, a 5% reduction in the risk that her cancer will come back some point in the next 10 years, then it really matters whether we're talking about 5% or 3% or 7%. And so in that context, we really have to have numbers and we have to make it very clear how that magnitude of risk reduction fits into her larger set of risks that she faces as a breast cancer patient. So absolutely, purpose is, is an essential element of developing this, and that helps, to, I think, the communicator to decide how much detail is important and what can be perhaps made secondary as we develop individually tailored tools for particular purposes. Thank you, Brian. And Brad, our operator at Verizon, if we don't have anybody in the queue for a voice question, we'll go ahead and move on to our next session. We have no responses at this time. Okay. So I'll take a moment now to uh, introduce session three, entitled Online Risk Assessment Tools and Public Health. We're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Steve Wollishan and Lisa Schwartz from Dartmouth Medical School um, with us today to present their talk, uh, Know Your Chances, Putting Cancer in Context. So, Steve and Lisa, if you could go to the arrows at the bottom of your screen and click through, uh, you should have control. Okay. Can you hear me? We yeah. can. Okay, great. So, um, well, thank you very much. It's a, you know, an honor to be he uh, here with you guys today. Um, so, there's lots of efforts uh, to promote disease awareness out there. Um, this in 2012, there are more than 55 officially designated disease awareness uh, observances. Um, March 2012 is colorectal cancer month, but there's also a bunch of other officially designated observances for lots of different disorders, including sleep disorders, kidney disorders, endometriosis, 
HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, brain awareness, diabetes, and so on. Um, and some of these things are pretty high profile. Um, back in um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I guess some people still refer to it as October, um, the, uh, the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders put on a huge a halftime uh, spectacular in which, among other things, they formed human pink ribbons. Um, and uh, th you know, these things are very um, effective. They get people thinking, they get people aware, and they start asking questions. Hopefully they can get good answers. Let's consider um, a dialogue. This is like the Robert dialogue you just heard. <laughs> this, is, so this involves Mrs. Smith, and she says, Doc, that halftime show got me thinking, just what is my chance of breast cancer? And then after a thoughtful pause, Dr. Jones says, well, it, it's unlikely. Now, some people may be um, disappointed by Dr. Jones's answer. Um, in particular, they may be focused on that, the word unlikely. What exactly does unlikely mean? And that's a problem because words have a variable interpretation. Um, speaking of unlikely, a, a person with the same last name as me, Will Ocean, but not me, but in the same field, did a study back in 1994 asking patients to assign probabilities to words. And um, she asked them to look at the word unlikely, among other words. And for unlikely, the uh, median response was that unlikely meant about 18%, the chance of something happening about 18%. But the um, range of answers went from 0% to about 50%. So unlikely could mean zero, it's not going to happen, but it might mean 50-50. Um, another person did a similar study um, that was published in the New England Journal looking at physicians interpretation of words. And here the word unlikely had an even broader range from zero to about 60%. That was among physicians. And this is a problem because if you're trying to talk to people about chance, you need to have some um, consistency about the meaning of, of what you're saying. And that's why, uh, that's why people invented numbers. Um, sorry. The, uh, it is possible to get good numbers, and we've heard about some of the great tools that are out there, including the breast cancer risk assessment tool. If um, the, the woman in our example went there, she could enter information about herself, and then um, she's a 55-year-old woman, um, she had her first menstrual period between age 12 and 13, and so on, press the calculate button, and then she would get output that looks like this. Um, her five-year risk is 1.6%. Uh, now, there's a lot of really good things about this output, I think. Um, first of all, it's clear about the time frame. We just uh, ta heard some discussion about that. It's absolutely essential to include a clearly defined time frame when you're talking about chance. Um, risk accumulates over time, and if you're not clear about the time frame, then you're not really communicating anything meaningful. And that's very clear in this, uh, this output. Um, and it's also clear about the risk of what? Some of these risk calculators out there aren't clear about whether you're talking about getting disease, dying from disease, or what kind of disease you're talking about. This one is clear. It's about developing invasive breast cancer. But the question is, um, you know, it says 1.6 percent. It's still not clear, though, because people aren't often used to looking at numbers and probabilities and chance over time. So is that 1.6% small, medium, or large? How worried should you be? Is it a big deal? And the issue here has been studied. Um, I know Brian uh, had a bunch of citations. He missed uh, one classic uh, citation. Um, it's a classic paper by Scott Adams from 1999. He'll have to add it to his reference list, but I'll go over it quickly. What Scott Adams showed was that um, Congress considered a music safety law after studies showed a 10% increase in piano-related deaths. And Dogbert asks, well, how does that compare to other health risks? Should I be concerned? And that's, you know, that's exactly the question, the question of context. In order to put things, um, give meaning, you have to have context. And the breast cancer risk assessment tool does that by giving context. It gives the, um, not only this particular woman's chance, so her chance of five years is 1.6%, but it also shows that the average woman, 55-year-old woman's chance is 1.5%, so she can see that she's about at average, maybe slightly above average. Now, the problem is, it's still not clear, is that 
big or small? How worried should she be? Is just because she's around the average, you know, does that mean that she's facing a big or a small risk? One way to help um, is by providing another kind of context. That's by comparing the chance of the disease under consideration to other diseases. The problem is that comparisons are ambiguous unless the diseases have an outcome of equal severity. So if I told you your chance of developing prehypertension, you know, is 1.6 percent, your chance of developing a huge lung mass is 1.6 percent, that has a very different meaning. And the way to put these things um, into context is by having, uh, by putting them on an equal severity footing. And one way to do that is death. Um, and what death does is death puts um, things on the same scale of severity. So here's another dialogue. Here's a man. He's playing chess with death. And he says, breast cancer, diabetes, thyroid cancer, heart disease, so many things to worry about. I can't decide how to keep you away. And death says, well, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but I'd focus on heart disease if I were you because death knows something. Death knows how these things are ordered. So let's, let's do just that. So we'll shift gears. Instead of talking about the woman's chance of developing breast cancer, let's talk about her chance of dying from breast cancer. So how does the chance of dying from breast cancer compare to the chance of dying from other diseases? Well, in this table, we provide that information. Imagine a 1,000 women your age. In the next 10 years, how many will die of these different things? So um, for breast cancer, her chance is about 6 out of 1,000 over the next 10 years. That may be seem big or small to her, but then she can see that lung cancer is 2 out of 1,000, heart disease is 8 out of 1,000, and the best sort of context is her chances overall. All-cause chance is about 55 out of 1,000 over the next 10 years. Now, this information is very helpful, but it can be made even better by accounting for another risk factor, which in addition to age and gender is probably the most powerful predictor of death, and it's a common risk factor, that's smoking. And so the numbers I've shown you here are for a non-smoker. But imagine that this woman was a smoker. Look what happens to these numbers. Um, if she's a current smoker, uh, her breast cancer risk is now dwarfed by her lung cancer risk or her heart disease risk. Her all-cause chance of dying in the next 10 years is actually doubled. So it's really crucial to account for, um, for uh, smoking when, when you're looking at chance of, of dying, and that's an important piece of, of uh, information for context. We've created um, risk charts, which are simple tables, which provide the chance of dying at different ages for different diseases over the next 10 years for men and for women, and they're broken down by smoking, uh, never smokers and current smokers. And these charts are helpful. You can look across the chart to see how things compare from one disease to another. You can look down the chart to see how risk changes within a disease over, uh, over age. And that gives a person a chance to get some context for um, their, their chance of dying. We published a paper in the Journal of National Cancer Institute showing our methodology for parsing out death by, by smoking status. And uh, we encourage people to, to, to try to do that in, uh, in the operative risk calculators. Um, and now Lisa is going to talk about a wonderful uh, collaboration we're doing with the people at SEER trying to make this sort of information available. So um, we have been thrilled about taking this idea and making it a reality and working with the wonderful group at SEER, including Rocky Foyer, who's in the room, and Angela Mariato and Nadia Hallander to develop a website which we call um, Know Your Chances, Interactive Risk Charts to Put Cancer Risk in Context to um, build on our idea of risk charts and presenting cancer and non-cancer statistics together. Um, this is a website that's in development um, and we hope that will be online sometime within the next year. Um, so what I'd like to do is to walk you through the main pages of the um, website. So the first feature is called Big Picture Charts, which are ready-made charts with a 10-year chance of dying from major causes. And um, what we allow you to do is to decide who you want the charts for, whether it's men or women. Um, and by race and by different age categories since the causes, the big causes of death are different. Um, and to um, allow people to get their favorite numeric format, we let people choose whether they want percents or out of a thousand. 
and um, these are pre the causes of death um, here are preset, and the output. Um, oh, oops, I went the wrong way. Sorry. Okay, and the output will look something like this. Um, the next feature is where you can create custom charts, and this is the same idea about creating risk charts, but now we're giving people more freedom um, to get exactly what they want. Um, and the freedom that we're allowing them is that you can change the time frame. So instead of having it be 10 years, you can get 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, or remaining life expectancy. And you can choose from a whole host of diseases that you want to see. So you can create your own charts. The third feature is actually takes a little bit of a different perspective. We call it your chances. And this is looking at it rather from an individual level. And um, let me read you what we are doing here. Um, here we're creating pie charts which show your chances over the next 10 years in two different ways. The pie charts present the chance that someone, your sex, race, and age will die from anything in the next 10 years, what we call the glass half-empty form, and the chance they'll survive the next 10 years, the glass half-full form, and they show you the top causes of death that make up that chance. So you tell um, us you know, who you are and um, how many causes of death you want to see, and the output looks like this. And um, in the center, the center pie chart is who you are now. Um, and the pie chart gives you um, all-cause mortality. And then it allows you to see, um, as you can see, this is under construction. So there would be actual causes of death where it says COD. And um, so you could see the top five causes of death. And then to provide some context here, what we wanted to show people was what um, things look like when they were 10 years younger um, and what they will look like when they're 10 years older so that you can still have that context about how things change with age. And then the final feature um, is um, what we call special cancer tables because from the SEER data, we have both the chances of getting and dying from specific cancers. And um, here, people will be able to um, generate getting and dying of various cancers um, for different populations over different time frames and generate charts um, that will look like this, where you can see um, the cancers that you want across various ages um, of both the chance of diagnosis and chance of death. And we. Um, are really excited about the website, but the website is still in development, and so we um, would love to hear suggestions and um, feedback if people have it for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa and Steve. Um, we can start to take questions now um, before we switch to our next session that's scheduled to begin at three attendance after three. So if anybody has questions of Steve and Lisa about putting cancer in context and communicating risk that way, um, please chime in online or by the phone. Or in the room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's very nice. Um, uh, I wondered, um, let's see, uh, you, you don't, uh, you're, you're using sort of national data on mortality statistics, is that right, for the um, without covariates? Is that a fair statement? And then um, is it possible uh, to break that down by smokers versus non-smokers uh, in terms of uh, mortality? Uh, like, likewise, for the incidence data, are, are these uh, incidents, they're specific to age and racial group, but but no other covariates, but can you do smoking? Um, I, guess. Well, I, I forgot to mention that in the first version that we won't be accounting for smoking, but in the second version, um, Rocky, <laughs> we um, will be working on smoking um, because it is such an important covariate. I mean, you know, you see that, I mean, for lung cancer, heart disease, all-cause mortality. Um, so, yes, they are all general population. The first 
version that will go up will just be like much of the data that's on the SEER website and under and from, Nas- from the National Center for Health Statistics, which are just based on age and sex, and then we hope to refine it um, by smoking status. That would be very valuable. Even to get the smoking data is not that easy. Uh, <laughs> I think it'll be very interesting. Yeah, so we won't be able to get it all from one source. We'll be getting it from different sources and putting it together. Of course, the mortality statistics are not by smoking. Right. Lisa and Steve, thanks for that great talk. This is Bill Klein. Um, question for you and also a question that Brian could answer if he's still on the line. Both of you talked about contextual factors. Uh, Brian mentioned the importance of providing kind of a comparative context, and you mentioned that as well, Steve and Lisa. Um, and then in your talk, you mentioned the context of other diseases. And obviously, there are other kinds of contextual variables one could take into account as well. I wonder if there's any sort of sweet spot that we know about yet in terms of how much context to give people before we hit that um, line of providing them too much information and leading to the kind of confusion that that both Steve um, and Lisa and and also Brian talked about. Is there a sweet spot? And then another question, related question would be, do you think uh, or is there any empirical evidence to suggest that certain kinds of contextual information might outweigh other kinds of contextual information in these contexts? Has anyone made any attempt to try to draw those um, comparisons between different kinds of contexts? Um, well, I just want to be clear. We haven't studied the risk charts with patients, and I, I and I guess the question is also in what way that you use these things. So, I mean, if it's, I mean, it's, I think there's also a use um, for disease context for doctors as well. I mean, I think most of us are really, I mean, until we did this work ourselves, I don't think we had any idea of what these numbers are like. And um, I think that some of it is about grounding people in sort of the order of magnitude. And, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there's um, – because some of it is about helping doctors to know where to focus um, in addition to patients and whether a doctor is going over something with a patient or whether a patient is, you know, or members of the public are looking at it themselves. And I guess we also – um, you know, or even you can imagine that journalists could use something like our website because a lot of times when they're presenting information, I think the public, you know, doesn't have a feel for what those numbers mean. And by maybe providing, you know, not, you know, all of the things in the risk chart, but a couple of pieces that then it sort of grounds that information in, um, in a way. And, but I'm, you know, the, that's completely Opinion, um, not um, research based. Brian, did you have anything to add if you're still on the line? I didn't actually. I mean, the, the, the general comments of, of putting numbers into context pervades, I think, both my work and Steve and, and Lisa's. And yeah, I think there's a lot of value <laughs> being able to understand what your particular risk is and then being able to put it into the, the larger set of, should I be paying attention to this risk or is there another one, whether it be those things associated with smoking or heart disease, et cetera, to, to make that more meaningful. I think it's very valuable to be able to look at the broad picture. Um, but I sometimes wonder, uh, I know that if you, if you done a prevention trial for a particular disease, sometimes the question is, should we look at all-cause mortality? And you realize that you won't be able to see anything if you look at all-cause mortality. You were trying to prevent this particular disease. Uh, It only constitutes a small slice of the total total picture. If you can cut that disease risk in half uh, with little toxicity, um, you really accomplish quite a bit, but you wouldn't see it in the broad picture, and it wouldn't you, you almost, if you looked at the broad picture, might not be inspired to do that kind of research. Yet I think, you know, incrementally you can make a lot of progress if you could uh, uh, attack each of the wedges. So, but, I, but I'm not, uh, uh, but I, I, I think it's very valuable to look at the broad picture, but, but there is this other point of view. Uh, you can look at, you know, you should look at the, you should work on the wedges too. <laughs> So this is Andy Freeman. Steve and Lisa, I wonder if you could comment on some of your work with 
black box or uh, FDA labels and how that may differ from predictions for cancer risk in the, in the sense that, you know, a patient may decide right there and then, am I going to take this drug or am I not going to take this drug and what could happen to me as opposed to, well, maybe I'll go get a colonoscopy in two years because my risk will be high enough. I wonder if you could comment whether or not the communication of risk or or how it's presented differs at all in, in that type of circumstance, or is it pretty much the same type of thing? I think that <clears throat> I think that the the, the, the uh, problem and the solution is fundamentally the, the same. I mean, our idea is that you can provide people with information, and we think that using tables and numbers um, works. We have a, a number of studies showing that people are able to use numbers and are able to make – it helps improve their decisions, particularly with the drug facts box work that we've done where we're showing people the chances of whatever the outcome is with and without the, the drug, um, and we've shown that people can make better decisions. And I think the same thing is true with, um, with you know, with cancer, with screening um, um, of scenarios as well. We've got boxes, we call them screening facts boxes, showing what the chance of, of dying from different you know, cancers are with and without um, available screening tests, again, in a particular time frame um, and, and so on. So I think that it's a – and the harms as well. It's important to have the harms represented in the, in the same way as the benefits in order to give a fair representation. And just to get back to what um, the, one of your earlier questioners, I think it was, um, I think it was Mitch Gale, was asking about, you know, the, the fact that it's hard to show a change in all-cause mortality. I think that's true, and, and I think that one important point though is to help people understand how big um, different causes of death are, so that they may, they, a lot of times, people overestimate how big a particular cause is, and it may be a little reassuring to people to know. Now, it's it's true that there's it, it may in some way undermine efforts to try to promote screening um, or other prevention um, efforts as well. But that but, but the most important thing I think is to let people make good decisions. And the way that they can make good decisions is to give them the information, give them the data, and then encourage them to make their own value judgment based on what they think is is important. Um, Brad, do we have any questions on the phone? We've had no responses at this time. <laughs> okay. This is uh, Rocky Porter again. <laughs> and do uh, you, you think what's the, the, the value or usefulness in, in addition to providing risk, have uh, tools to help people elicit their own values? So they so they sort of get a sense of how they value this thing over that thing, and some of these things are not so obvious how you how you might value different things, but maybe there might be tools that could couple with these risk risk assessment and you know risk probabilities to help people to help people value things and couple these two kinds of tools. I, yeah, I mean that's certainly what many decision aids do, like the um, Ottawa decision aids, where they have scales and they get people to go through. Sort of, you know, they do the probabilities, and then they also do value elicitation. And I think that certainly could be something that might be part of, um, you know, risk prediction tools as well to help people think about, you know, how much um, they value different outcomes. Um, but I think the, the the one issue, I guess, is about to what extent the risk prediction tool just focuses on a single number, like what's your chance of disease, or is it focused more on sort of what's your chance you know, if you do this versus if you do that, and then it becomes, you know, when you're weighing the the trade-offs of, you know, trying to decide whether you either want to make a behavior change or, um, so um, it would probably depend on the on the kind of tool. Yeah, it may be especially important in the in the context of prognosis when there's a decision to be made, getting uh, chemotherapy with all the toxicities and things like that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. When 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 there are trade-offs, and that I think ha helping people to think through what those different, you know, what both the outcomes mean and the chance of the different outcomes is really helpful. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen Lisa. So with Thanks. that, we're going to switch into session four, which is focused on implementation.
um, and we're hoping to hear lessons from uh, the probably most popular of the risk assessment tools out there, the Your Disease Risk website, and also uh, from a group that really tackled the nuts and bolts of what it means to have uh, quality interfaces um, from the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration. Uh, so we're going to start with Dr. Graham Koditz and Erica Waters joining us from St. Louis um, and talking about the culmination of 17 years of transdisciplinary research on the Your Disease Risk website. Erica and Graham? Kelly, you can hear us? We can hear you. Great. Thank you. Thanks to you and Bill and your team for inviting us to zoom in from St. Louis and um, share with you 17 years of experience, um, and we hope we're able to show some of that in the next 20 minutes here. We'll focus this on our tool, as you say, that is widely viewed, your disease risk, which of course started as a cancer risk assessment tool. Back in 1994, Harvey Feinberg was Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health and as part of his effort to focus the mission of the school and its impact on improving health outcomes, he created the Harvard Center for Cancer Prevention with the goal of uh, improving understanding of cancer causes and prevention and communicating behavior change and the cutting edge research in the Harvard and broader scientific community to the broader society to reduce the burden of cancer. That led to a number of uh, activities. The initial faculty meeting set priorities to uh, review and synthesize and publish uh, what we knew about the causes of cancer and what we knew about strategies for prevention. The bigger issue, of course, was that faculty thought oh, all we really need to do is publish a review article in something like JNCI and we'll be done. But obviously there was substantial input that said, hey, to reach the public, we need a far broader approach than merely publishing in the scientific literature. That gave us a, a major challenge. Uh, we had to span outside of our comfort zones and bring together knowledge, perspectives, understanding, and experience from many disciplines. And I think in the process, we got to a product that none of us could have imagined ahead of time. <coughs> we brought together many, and I would say many, many disciplines. We had a work group that took a couple of years to review the evidence, statisticians, epidemiologists, computer science, psychology, risk assessment, environmental health, a whole range of disciplines to first synthesize the evidence on causes, then prevention, and the strategies for communicating this with the public. So let me review a timeline here. 94, Harvey started the center. We did our first reports. We agreed that we needed to develop a tool to communicate risk to the broader public. That only took us four years to 1998 to uh, resolve how to do that. At the time, pencil and paper was the medium of choice, given that a lot of input suggested those who most needed prevention messages had low literacy, if any, little access to computers, so we developed pencil and paper tools with fairly um, what we thought was simple 
map. Karen Emmons did focus group work and showed that people couldn't add up and subtract amongst other factors, and so we moved over to a uh, web development strategy by 1999. By 2000, we launched our first four cancer site, accounting for literally half of all newly diagnosed cancers in the United States. That was then expanded to 12 cancers, 80% of the cancers diagnosed. And shortly after we had that up and running, we started to realize that, hey, our prevention messages for um, not smoking, healthy diet, avoiding weight gain, being physically active, actually apply to many other chronic diseases. So we embarked on the expansion from your cancer risk to your disease risk. That was launched in 2004, and subsequent steps included translation to Spanish, and finally transfer of ownership to uh, Washington University when I moved here at the end of 2006. We've had constant, what we'll call heavy use, uh, while it varies day to day during the week with a regular pattern, uh, we nevertheless, oops, we've um, got an estimate of uh, approximately 4 million visitors since we went, went live in the year 2000. What does this look like? The early coverage, remember in 2000, this is sort of prehistory in thinking about websites. Harvard was excited that we had a new cancer risk website breaking records for the School of Public Health web traffic. By 2004, we had The Guardian describing this as a way to assess your health risk with a very long name. Subsequently, Tara Parker Pope was still at the Wall Street Journal, and um, she managed to pull off a road in New York because she couldn't use a cell phone and drive, and uh, interviewed me, and um, we got coverage in the Wall Street Journal. And then, uh, subsequent, as we'll come back to, following eHealth standards, we actually got a, an award there and then uh, reflecting our lack of funding from uh, drug companies or other sources of conflict of interest, uh, Tara Parker Pope made a link to us in one of her blog posts in um, 2009, and we got a nice boost in traffic as a result of that. So to wrap up the site development, obviously we've had multiple uh, components across faculty, uh, support staff, communications experts, computer science, technology, and all working together uh, and in a very iterative uh, process. As you'll see, we are not an absolute risk tool. Um, this reflects input along the way in the development process that Erica will talk more about, but throughout we've had this uh, continuous input update of where is the science, where is the design and communication technology, what does this all mean for um, communicating risk in a state-of-the-art way to get cancer prevention messages and chronic disease prevention messages uh, to the general public. As far as, far as the um, development of the communication end of things and the usability end of things, um, there is a considerable, a considerable amount of research conducted as Graham said, by Karen Emmons, Mike Atkinson, Hank Dart, um, and my former 
graduate advisor, Neil Weinstein, who has now retired to Tucson. Um, and this research included uh, experiments and interviews and focus groups and intensive reviews of the literature, um, both empirical literature, what was available at the time. Again, this is up through maybe 99 or 2000. Um, in the initial development, and then also um, several different theoretical approaches, what we knew about um, communication theory, psychology theory, um, and, and other sorts of um, approaches. The, um, as I mentioned, communication strat strategies themselves were based on the core principles of risk communication. Um, risk perception and health behavior change. And one of the things that was agreed on um, very, very early on was the, the vital importance of, of helping people recognize that they can actually change their risk. And not only to, to help them realize this, but to provide very specific behavioral <laughs> recommendations. Um, they did not want to assume that anyone knew, you know, make no assumptions about knowledge amongst the public because the public is so incredibly diverse. Um, again, the purpose of this was to motivate behavior change, um, not to help people wrestle with a difficult decision as, as was reflected in some of the previous talks. So the tool that was developed really reflects that purpose of, of motivation. So we considered, they considered multiple issues along the way. As I mentioned, the principles of risk communication. Some of the things that were addressed was uh, the number of risk levels. Do we use five risk levels or, or seven? Um, this is another one of those ongoing debates that, that Brian mentioned about um, when you're assessing or when you're, you're showing risks like this, how, how detailed do you go? Um, what types of words should be used as descriptors? There was, there was pretty quick agreement that words should be included, but the, the type um, was in question, and, and I'll illustrate that shortly. Uh, what type of visual display? There are bar graphs. Um, the pictographs actually weren't prominent on the scene at the time, but uh, thermometers and speedometers um, were also considered. Uh, and then. There was also the need felt to convey an approximation of personal absolute risk. And this reflects back this idea that this is a relative risk calculator, but the need to, to show people about what their absolute risk is was also important. And this was accomplished in kind of a unique way. You'll see on the right of the screen um, the output for your disease, an example output for your disease risk. And then there's a black bar labeled your risk. Now, we're not going to pretend that's absolute risk in the sense of 2.4% risk. Um, but what that does is it shows people where they are, and it also shows people, it provides a, a verbal label, either high, average, or low. So um, this is almost like a, a, a combination of multiple types of communication strategies blended into one graph for a specific purpose. Principles of behavior change were also considered. Um, specifically, um, again, what can people do? What actions can people take to change their risk? And so people were provided with a number of risk factors. And these, these risk factors were based on what they had entered before. So not everyone received the same types of risk factors. I, I pulled this off of a, off of a, um, off of a simulated uh, risk assessment where I, I made, I, I, I entered the data as though a person was at extraordinarily high risk of, of colorectal cancer. And what you see um, also is they can, <coughs> on the TIPS uh, hyperlinks, then it goes to a place where it links to American Heart Association, um, Centers for Disease Control. There are also um, specific tips like jogging, walking, dancing, whatever you enjoy. Again, this was meant to um, address people's unmet information needs and to m help them relate it to their own lives. We also included principles of persuasion and adult learning. 
um, the old the old um, uh, persuasion literature from social psychology, the heuristic systematic model, the elaboration likelihood model, all of those were considered in the development. And we also went into the educational literature to see how adults learn, because that's what this really is. It's, a, it's adult learning. And so one of the things that came up out of that was this idea of um, uh, active engagement in some way. And the way they accomplished this was by enabling people to actually watch how their risk changed if they were to choose a specific uh, prevention strategy. So you see that the risk on this slide is above average and all of the boxes on the right are blank. You click two of those boxes and you see how the risk drops. And excuse me, I, I, I made an error in a, a previous slide. The absolute risk connotation was, was indicated by your lowest possible risk. Now, what this, what this also includes is another thing that, that Brian had mentioned previously about providing course-level data for an initial step and then more specific data later. And you can see that by the links at the bottom that say what makes up my risk and what does my risk mean. So um, that includes information about um, the actual factors, the, the, the identification of the specific factors that increase and decrease people's risk. As Graham mentioned, we also took into account user ability um, and, and facility. In other words, um, did they have access to computers and how familiar were they? Um, I was, uh, I, I, I remember, uh, I was not working in academia in the year 2000. I was, I was doing menial work as a, um, not menial, but, but customer service work. And I remember teaching people how to use a mouse over the phone. So this is where we were um, in, in that time. So they didn't assume anything. Um, and that includes numeracy. So throughout all of this development, they were very aware of this idea that people have trouble, many people have trouble understanding and using uh, numerical information, particularly when the numerical information is complex. There were also website interaction uh, design navigation issues that came up. So what about different colors? One of the issues was, well, does this look too much like a commercial vitamin bottle? Um, where should we put the buttons? Um, how do we brand this so people know that it, at the time it was Harvard, um, you know, finding a brand for your disease risk and using that consistently? Um, so I mentioned all this research. Where are the publications? Um, at the time, the development of this website was largely um, not funded by grants. So um, that means that the work had to be done relatively quickly um, in an unfunded way, and uh, part of that was asking, answer, asking only very practical questions. And sometimes the practical questions that we need the, that are most important <laughs> implementations may not be of theoretical interest to academia. So that's where a lot of those publications ended up. Um, Okay. So when um, was a decision made to go live? Um, basically, the Your Disease Risk team asked several questions, including is the science in line with the uh, latest consensus review? Are our messaging uh, strategies sound? Do the changes affect the usability in a bad way? What about bugs or errors in programming? And have we maintained good e-health practices? Is the privacy policy up to date? Um, have we disclosed any conflicts of interest or avoided them entirely? Those types of things. And I have um, web, a website to go to at the end that explains that a little bit more. Um, there were several practical considerations in conducting the research on this. Um, you know, one of the first things you think about when you think about a website is privacy and tracking. So the Your Disease Risk website doesn't place cookies on people's computers. So if you're doing access on the live site, 
um, what does that mean as far as um, as far as making sure that people are are protected? Uh, the consent process can be a barrier, especially for very low literacy populations. Um, attrition can be a problem. People can leave a website at any point during that website, and when you lose them, you may not be able to tell at which which web page on a particular site they're, they're, they are at. Um, and there are also incredible programming challenges um, involved in, in this process. So there are alternatives. I mean, you can recruit people after people have already obtained their risk results. Um, this precludes the idea of obtaining their risk scores because, again, to track the risk scores, you need to get consent before they um, – before you start tracking them. Um, and I did this in one of my early studies. The blue circular net <laughs> at the bottom is an illustration of, of how we approached that. So people got their risk score, and then they, those who clicked the next button were offered the opportunity to enroll in my study. Um, you can pull out a module out of a live site. That also has, I'll just call them, considerable technical challenges. Um, and again, the early developmental work was performed on paper because of this concern about low literacy populations. Um, as far as the technical challenges, I'm not sure if we have any people involved in on the technical end of things here. There are multiple types of pro computer programming involved, from just basic website design all the way through the process of calculating the risk code. And you have to find a way to make those languages talk together in a nice way, and, and that's difficult. That's especially difficult because languages change over time, including programming, and a language that was perfectly good 10 years ago may not be perfectly good today. Um, and so this idea of maintaining the website and keeping the flex website flexible and dynamic really needs constant attention from experts. So let's reiterate a few points and wrap up. <laughs> that obviously we have an active, engaging website with an average of about eight minutes uh, per user session. It has clearly engaged a transdisciplinary team of uh, public health-minded uh, faculty, staff, and uh, actual users providing input. Uh, we have uh, substantial growth in spin-off from this, including our community engagement activities out of our cancer center, uh, using many of the same uh, messages and so on that we have on our website, and often providing the website as backup for those community engagement activities. We've maintained a standard of science from the uh, beginning that uh, actually is documented on the website and in peer-reviewed publications. Our number of our scales have been validated uh, in prospective cohort data with ROC curve values published as one example of the documentation and a push for transparency, not just in our risk estimate calculator, but population prevalence data and other input to the risk estimation. The website has barely been down in its whole life, so we have succeeded, I think, in being uh, largely bug-free and uh, high uh, usability time. Our messages are consistent. Uh, that in part was buried in my statement that we moved from cancer to include the other chronic diseases. That also spreads out from the website to other messages that we use in our community engagement. <laughs> At one point we had a contract for Komen uh, to develop messaging materials for them, again using principles of uh, risk and health communication, we use the same messages there. 
and our alcohol message is consistent with the ACS. So we're pushing to be consistent wherever possible uh, to avoid um, the sense of confusion by users. We've avoided financial conflicts of interest. I mentioned that. And Tara Parker Pope writing on it certainly helped our web traffic. And we've worked to follow the principles of uh, good e-health practices with our online uh, documentation. In that spirit, we provide you with some <laughs> references both to the published articles that underlie much of the development and principles of the user interface and some of the media attention that the website has generated. So we thank you for this chance to share our work with you. Graham and Erica, thank you very much um, for your presentation. I think we'll do this session a little differently than the other ones, and that is before we pass on to Robert Polk and then go to questions, I think we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions for you guys, because I can imagine that there are some that are specific to the Your Disease Risk calculator um, that maybe aren't related to patient decision aid standards. So I'm going to go ahead at this point um, and open things up to questions. Uh, we have a couple uh, that have been typed in, but I do uh, want to bring up something, Graham and Erica, that we talked about on the phone earlier um, that's for maybe the benefit of all of the attendees, and Andy Friedman might jump in as well, and that is you know, I really appreciate that your site was set up um, with the intention to provide behavioral recommendations to encourage people to reduce their risk and love that you base those principles on um, persuasion and adult learning. And I just wonder how um, you kind of reconcile some of the advice that you give that's based on population data with the fact that it may or may not, you know, affect the individual's risk who's actually putting their data into the calculator at any given point in time. I think I shared with you that that's something that we struggle with here. And so I'm sure that over 17 years you've had those discussions with your statisticians and just want to know how you came out on the side of uh, providing recommendations. And Andy, I don't know if you have a ah, question. Yeah, so I think if I'm getting the <coughs> crux of the question, our group in the early phase that actually led to the fourth report from the Center for Cancer Prevention had laid out against IR criteria definite, probable, and possible causes of cancer classifying factors. And um, no one doubted that we should put recommendations in on definite consensus causes of cancer. Probable causes, that means it's more likely than not that they're a cause. Um, one more really good study would nail it. Um, we thought for people in the general public, if we're recommending safe lifestyle um, strategies, then it was sort of more likely than not that it was beneficial not to gain weight, so to speak. And so we opted to include our definite and probable factors, but not to include the category possible and we refused to publish um, a list that we had been developing of sort of other factors that had appeared somewhere in the literature once as a possible risk factor, in a sense thinking that that would give too much credibility to random uh, false positive findings. It's also a very basic precept of risk communication that you, you don't alarm people unless you provide them with a way to reduce their fear because um, that can be counterproductive. Um, they may begin ignoring recommendations. and so, so if they're afraid and you don't offer them a way to get out of that, then, then that fear remains. And so one way of, for them of avoiding this fear, this constant fear, is to say, you know what, I'm just not going to think about it anymore. I'm not going to get screened. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, so that's that's a very a very basic part of it. Um, unreleased stress like that can also be um, in a long term damaging to health. So there's some data out of the early work based off of I think it was Three Mile Island that the people who were in 
uh, or near the affected area who were not able to move had long-lasting stress experiences that people who were able to move out of that area did not have. So that's why we, we needed to provide those specific recommendations across the board. Thanks, Erica. Have you, uh, are any of these recommendations uh, tailored to the level of risk? And have you ever made recommendations um, that you had to, uh, that needed to be revised in subsequent editions? Uh, I mean, we hear so much about um, uh, clinical trials reversing well-established epidemiologic associations when it came to the actual intervention itself. Did you include any any uh, intervention that uh, that surprised that, that 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 needed to be reversed over the 17 years? And uh, uh, yeah, so the really two questions: To what extent do, do the kinds of behavior changes that you recommend really depend on risk? That's the first one. Or are they applicable to the general population without regard to risk? And have you ever had situations where you, in view of the evolving literature, especially clinical trials literature, had to change your recommendations? So two two good questions. Um, the first, uh, the recommendation tips for change in behavior are uh, constant for um, each behavior regardless of the level of risk. Um, the actual messages actually breaks into two parts. Some of the risk factors have changed over time as more evidence has accumulated, say, on um, obesity and uh, lack of physical activity from the late 90s to 2010. World Health Organization, IARC, World Cancer Research Fund have put out reports. We have an ongoing review process of the science every uh, three years for each of our major categories, so cancer every three years on a different timeline, heart disease and stroke on a third timeline, the diabetes. So we are constantly reviewing evidence and um, I know we've gone back over the issues around fat and um, other components in diet, um, tomatoes, lycopene story, does that still hold for prostate or not? We had it there um, in the beginning. And as the evidence reports come out, we definitely um, revise the input to the risk calculator and clearly if something is taken off uh, then the messages that go with that in the interactive component is also adjusted. Bottom line, yes there have been changes. I haven't got a timeline to tell you exactly what was changed when but there's a definite process in place to um, keep it and I think Eric appointed to the the issue of maintaining um, the website, I mention it too, it's not something you can put up and go to sleep and never think about again. Thanks, Graham. So we're going to take one more quick question for you guys before we continue with the session. Uh, this comes from Susana Ramirez, and her question is, uh, what is the logic for separating the cancer questionnaires up front? She says, I wonder from a user's perspective, because she was just trying to estimate her own cancer risk, uh, if it would make more sense to group all cancer risk questions for the questionnaire and then present separate risk models for each cancer type at the end. And she asks this because she wonders whether the public really makes a distinction between types of cancer or whether it's all one disease. Good question. And the focus group uh, work that Karen Emmons conducted with um, of the ethnic low in population in Boston as the extreme test uh, really pushed us to the model we have that um, people weren't interested in answering 70 questions before they got any result. They wanted 
the engagement of answering a few questions, getting a result. Part of the complexity, again, Erica pointed to having entered your smoking data, admitting you're a smoker, whatever it is, that result is carried forward for you. People really like that. It sends the message that smoking is also related to kidney cancer. You go somewhere else, oops, smoking comes up again. So there's a, a message there that if you just fill in 70 items up front, you don't do it in the context of the cancer in front of you. So the communication, uh, usability, sort of our behavioral psychology health literacy team pushed us to go with the design we have. Great. Thank you very much. Kelly? Yes. Can I just add real briefly um, on regard to the last question? Um, one of the things, though, that about the making recommendations that you might have to later go back and change, there are some behaviors that that we just know are very, very bad. So you would never not recommend that a smoker stop smoking. You would never recommend that a person who's not physically active at all, you know, continue that physical activity. And so even though if, if some small minor things might change, and I don't know if lycopene is in or not, but the overall message of eat a healthy diet, don't smoke, be physically active, remains the same. Good point. Thanks, Erica. Okay, with that, we're going to continue on our implementation session and turn this over to Dr. Robert Volk at MD Anderson Cancer Center, who's going to um, talk about risk assessment and informed decision making and give us perspectives from the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration, or IPDAS. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate having some time today, and I know we're at the end of a, a fairly long session. I appreciate people sticking with us here. One of the perils of uh, naming your project early on is changes in technology. So if you Google HIPDAS, invariably Google will change it to iPads. And you'll find a lot of things that don't have anything to do with, with uh, 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 standards for developing patient decision aids. So I'm really going to um, expand the discussion quite a bit um, in, in that um, the International Patient Decision Aids Collaboration Group um, you know, has done some work around establishing standards for decision aids where risk, or what um, we're calling you know, probabilities when we look at the different um, uh, dimensions of decision aids, play a very important role, but only one of many roles in, in helping patients make informed decisions. Um, so. Uh, Today I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, first I need to define um, informed or shared decision making and also, also patient decision aids. And then um, I'll discuss briefly the IPDAS story, a little bit about how the organization was formed, um, some of the work that the collaboration has done, and sort of where we're going uh, uh, with IPDAS. Um, I'll comment on um, sort of my thoughts on the role of risk assessment in current patient decision support tools, and then try to sort of connect the dots for, for the modelers who are, who are creating these risk prediction uh, tools and the developers and disseminators of patient decision aids um, so that we can kind of come up with sort of a, you know, maybe the beginnings of a common agenda. Uh, so uh, first off, there's been a lot of attention in the literature for quite a while now about the importance of shared decision making and preference sensitive decisions. And I've just got a couple of highlights here from some recent articles, uh, perspective piece in uh, New England Journal of Medicine by Michael Berry, uh, just a wonderful commentary in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute about our need to shift our, our approach to cancer screening. And then a commentary we published in um, JAMA about the never-ending uh, prostate cancer screening debate. So we're really interested in those questions where there's uncertainty about an optimal strategy. In other words, we're interested in developing tools for the close calls, where there's not a clear dominant strategy, and really it's the patient's preferences for the different options that should drive uh, the optimal choice. And I've got a few examples on this slide here uh, in cancer treatment. Uh, treatments for localized prostate cancer are a great example. 
and then there are many in uh, cancer screening, including prostate, colorectal, and now lung is uh, back in play with the results of the National Lung Screening Trial. Okay, so let's define uh, informed decision making. And this definition comes from the CDC, was published back in 2004, and I think it's still right on target. So in, for an informed decision to occur, an individual needs to understand the nature of the disease or the condition. So we really can't talk about risk until the patient understands the condition in which they have and the decisions in which they're facing. So that's really a core knowledge issue. Um, also, the individual needs to understand the, the, the treatment or screening services that are available to them. They need to understand the risks and limitations of those services, the potential benefits, and if there are alternatives related to those uh, services. They also need to consider their values and their preferences as appropriate in making the decision. So what's important to the patient in making the decision is really central in making a preference-based decision. Um, people also talk about uh, the patient um, considering how involved they want to be in the decision. What is their preference for involvement? Um, there's some very interesting uh, research that has shown that preference for involvement does vary by sociodemographic group and so on. But there's also, and I think even more important research that shows once patients are educated about the decisions they face and brought in to be partners with the decisions, invariably they want to participate. They're much less likely to defer authority to um, you know, uh, an expert such as uh, uh, their doctor. And then finally, uh, for an informed decision to make, the patient needs to make a decision that's consistent with his or her values. Informed decision-making becomes shared decision-making when decisions are made within consultation with a healthcare provider. Okay, so here we have a long definition of patient decision support technologies or patient decision aids, and I want to highlight a couple of things here in this, uh, in this uh, definition. So patient decision support interventions or patient decision aids uh, help people think about the choices they face. So they help them deliberate. They provide them information about the options that they face and where it's reasonable, including the option of taking no action. These interventions, as I mentioned, help people deliberate independently and in collaboration with others, including their health care provider, and by considering the relevant attributes of the different options that they face. Decision aids also help people forecast how they might feel about the short-term, the intermediate, and long-term outcomes of interventions they may select. So there's an affective forecasting component to patient decision aids. And it's now recognized that patient decision aids also help patients construct preferences or construct values around what's important to them. Early on in, in the literature and the thinking, there was sort of an assumption that patients already had clear values and preferences for what they wanted to do, and the real task of the clinician or the task of the decision aid was to un uncover them. We now recognize that actually those values are being formed as patients interact with the information and with their providers, so they're really being constructed. So patient decision aids are not designed to advise, advise people to choose one action or another. They're not meant to be prescriptive. They are not meant to replace the clinician consultation, so they shouldn't be used in isolation. And the bottom line is they help prepare patients to make informed values-based decisions with their health care providers. Um, here's an example of some work we're launching here at MD Anderson where we have taken the results of the recent uh, national lung screening trial and begun work to develop a patient decision aid that we can integrate within flow in the Cancer Prevention Center. And I just included in this next slide here some screenshots of how we're handling um, communicating issues of false positives related to spiral CT, given that those rates really are pretty high. You know, if a patient stays on protocol, uh, comes in for spiral CT for, for three years, there's a good chance that that patient will have a positive result. And of those positives, um, the vast major majority of those will be false positive results. So we're coming up with ways to communicate this probabilistic information using animations and so on. And our other presenters have talked about similar work as well. <laughs> 
Okay, well, let's talk about IPDAS. So what is the IPDAS collaboration? Well, IPDAS began its work um, back in 2003 as part of the International Shared Decision-Making Conference. And at that time, the uh, researchers who got together um, were concerned about the plethora of decision aids that were being developed and disseminated, disseminated that really had varying quality. Um, and really were not being guided by any consistent, thoughtful standards. Um, there were concerns, for example, that you know many of the aids were developed without citing the evidence source, evidence sources behind you know the options that were being described. Um, there was also concern about how information was being presented and that it potentially was biased uh, in some of the presentational formats. And, um, you know, a real big concern is the potential for conflict of interest in that the developer may have a vested interest in the decision that the patient makes. And while it may look like an aid is promoting, uh, you know, an informed choice, actually the developers want the patient to select one option over another. So, so the purpose of IPDAS then, and this international group came together um, um, to um, enhance the quality and effectiveness of patient decision aids by establishing shared evidence-informed frameworks for improving their content development and implementation. Um, IPDAS has progressed through a number of phases. So I mentioned early on the forming of the, uh, the collaboration. A steering committee was uh, uh, constituted early on. And one of the products of the collaboration has been a checklist, um, a, a checklist that can be used by developers and adopters of decision aids to see how well their aids either stack up against those uh, uh, consensus-based standards, or to help developers have some guidance on how to develop their tools. Um, in uh, phase two, the collaboration has developed a more finely grained instrument for assessing the quality of patient decision aids that uh, goes beyond a simple checklist where you check the presence or absence of particular <coughs> Um, to looking at how well the aid addresses those different features. And that, if that, that checklist or the IBDASI instrument um, has now been uh, published. Uh, we're getting close to releasing um, uh, a paper on um, sort of minimal standards for uh, development um, of decision aids that's really being done in anticipation of certification efforts in the United States where AIDS will go through an independent certifying body to see how well they stack up against standards, and then that can be used with some sort of blessing that indeed the aid is certified. And um, we're also in the midst of an updating effort where we're going back over all the evidence uh, documents, um, the um, developments in theory and concepts, and updating those because we certainly need to revisit the standards periodically. Um, so moving along quickly. Um, the checklist was published uh, in uh, 2006 in the British Medical Journal and is available online at the uh, uh, IPDAS website, and I have a link uh, at the end of the uh, presentation if folks want to go and take a look at both the publication and the checklist as well. I want to make the point that the international collaboration was very careful in um, and um, making sure that we had significant stakeholder involvement in coming up with these standards. So while we did these wonderful reviews of the current evidence, of the current thinking in theory, of the current thinking in, in um, um, terminology, we were careful also to bring in stakeholders in evaluating these proposed criteria. So there was significant involvement from patients and patient advocate groups, Clinicians were brought in because we knew they were going to be some of the primary users of these tools, and they would be using them, of course, with their patients. It was important to have policymakers involved as well um, because of the recognition of preference-sensitive sensitive, uh, decisions and uh, increasingly in uh, practice guidelines. And, of course, researchers were at the table as well because they are primarily the developers. Fourteen countries were represented in the IPDAS collaboration, and over 100 people were involved in the voting process uh, for the initial checklist, which was done via an online Delphi process. 
these are the different quality dimensions um, that the collaboration identified. So we have essential content um, that should be included in decision aids. We also have generic criteria that are related to development and then some effectiveness criteria. I want to point out that probabilities are just one part of the essential content for patient decision aids. It's also important, for example, to have information about the options. In fact, we really can't talk about patients' risk if they don't understand the disease in which they have. So the collaboration has recognized the importance of providing information, providing up-to-date information, providing balanced information, and so on. The reason for the red line through the patient stories um, um, area is that we're still working through best practices for patient stories, and there's a lot of debate about them because we know they are very powerful and they can sway decisions one way or another, and we're, we, we still feel a need that there's a lot of uh, a need for research um, in that particular area. Okay. So this slide shows the eight criteria that were retained in the Abdassi instrument. These are the ones that directly relate to probabilities. And um, these can almost, also, almost be seen as sort of best practices for the development of uh, risk communication tools that are part of patient decision aids. And you'll see things in here that have been used before. So there's not a whole lot new um, um, in, in, in particular things that have been uh, pr uh, mentioned by our previous presenters. But for example, using visual display, um, talking about time frame, using event rates and natural frequencies and so on have all been retained by, by the um, collaboration in their tools. So our next steps are to update the background documents for the collaboration, and then really move towards um, minimal standards for developers <laughs> and, and adopters. Um, so the role of uh, risk assessment or risk calculators and patient decision support, again, this has already been covered by the previous um, presenters, so I'm going to go over this very quickly. Um, but one clear role um, is to determine sort of eligibility or who should get a decision aid. So, of course, using the Gale model to determine appropriateness for patients considering uh, medications to lower uh, risk of breast cancer is an example of that. Um, also, demonstrating incremental benefits and risks of screening is a very uh, important part of patient decision aids. And here we have an example of a tool from ASCO. Uh, looking at adjuvant endocrine therapy for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, comparing some of the risks and some of the benefits. And this is very much in line with Dr. Zickman Fisher's presentation earlier, where we can get a sense of what the incremental benefit or risk is of, of these various uh, interventions. And then here we have a, a tool from uh, University of Sydney um, that really is more of a full blown patient decision aid. So, what I want to point out is while they do have information of risk, related to stopping. In this case, the question is, uh, should a woman age 70 and older stop having mammograms? They give the risk of uh, dying of breast cancer if indeed she stopped and if she continued, so you can see sort of the magnitude of the difference. It also includes a personal worksheet to help women work through what's important to them in making that decision. And then at the end of the worksheet, they sort of get to, they get to indicate they're leaning for or against um, um, uh, stopping uh, mammograms. So it's, so it's a leaning scale that's part of, part of this tool. Okay. So connecting the dots. Um, one, one point that I want to make here is that, that we have an excellent literature on risk communication for patients and consumers, and we really don't need to reinvent the wheel here. I think what the developers need are just good risk prediction models, models that help us determine who indeed should receive an intervention, and then models that help us in evaluating uh, comparatively the different interventions that are being offered to patients. Also, in developing models, I think it's very important to ask patient-centered questions. Ask the questions that patients want answered. And again, Dr. Zickman Fisher talked about this earlier. Um, but the probabilities that we communicate to patients should be the ones that they are interested in and that are helpful for them in making decisions. And then finally, I think it's very important to recognize that risk prediction is only one piece of a broader puzzle in providing patient decision support, and that modelers um, should consider the implications of their models in fostering deliberation 
between clinicians and patients. How will the models be used? How will this information be used? Um, modelers can also think about how this information will be used in assessing trade-offs between harms and benefits and to work directly with sort of the end users, the people who are going to be um, working with these products uh, in, in the real world. So my concluding comments are that risk calculators can and do play an important part in screening and treatment decision making, but they're not sufficient for ensuring informed decisions. And they should be part of a broader strategy to educate patients about their options, harms, and benefits. And I'll stop there for questions. And here is the resources slide that I, that I mentioned earlier. So thank you very much. Dr. Vogt, thank you very much. Um, we'll take a few moments uh, uh, for questions before we turn it over to Paul Hahn for our closing remarks. So if anybody has questions about IPDOS, uh, how they came to consensus on standards for patient decision aids, or anything else? Thank you, Dr. Jen. Do, do you have any comment on um, in IPDOS about when uh, sort of uh, uh, patient decision aid should be publicly released versus released more in a clinical setting so that they could be done in terms of the clinician-patient uh, interaction and, and not released publicly because of some sense the sensitivity? Yeah, that's that's a very that's a very interesting question. So one of the perils of, of releasing aids to the public is that the, the you know the the interaction with the clinician may never happen. You know if the patient goes through a tool and and you know, you know goodness makes some misinterpretation of what the information is saying, they, they may not follow through and actually have that conversation with the clinician. So so there is that that peril there. Um, I think the tools are probably and we don't have evidence for this yet, but I think the tools are probably most effective when they are delivered at point of care. When, one, the patient is really invested in the particular decision um, that they're facing, and there is that sort of immediate opportunity to talk about what is important to them, to really work with their clinician in weighing, you know, options, harms, and benefits, and coming up with a values-based decision. I think we're really good at communicating risk and probabilities. I think the AIDS perhaps don't stand alone when it comes time to really fostering that sort of deliberative process and clarifying values. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the telephone? Once again, if you have a question, please press star than one. Please stand by. Okay. Oh, one more. Yeah. Sorry, I had a question. Um, you, you mentioned the term, I thought it was an interesting term of uh, kind of effective forecasting. And I think you meant something about, so for example, if somebody is considering prostate cancer screening, they're, they're, you're trying to elicit their values. You're trying to have them project themselves into a situation where now maybe they've had surgery and they become in, impotent or incontinent or something like that. And how well do people do people have the ability to, to project themselves into that situation? And have there been studies of the of what it's, what it's how their opinions change when they're actually in that situation versus projecting themselves into a situation which might be quite difficult? Right. So so the classic study is the one about um, pain medication during uh, labor, um, and and uh, you know, women being asked their preferences for pain medication before they go into labor, and then their preferences while they're in labor, and then their preferences afterwards sort of looking looking back. And, and, you know, and you know, the studies show that you, many women would prefer to have natural childbirth without the help of, of pain medication, but once in it, many would then opt for the medication, and, and later others would, afterwards others would look back and say, well, you know, if I had to do it again, I wish I hadn't. And so on. So that's sort of the, the, the classic example of how affective forecasting can lead to sort of errors or, or misperceptions about how you're going to feel about things. One way we try to get at that with patient decision aids is is the use of patient stories. And and again, there's you know a lot of uh, um, you know research about this, and there's still you know debate about whether or not we should be doing this because they are so powerful. Um, but, but people are invariably interested in the stories of others, of, of people who've gone through an experience, um, you know, to try to get a sense from them. 
about what that was like. Um, but, but you're right, the, the, one of the goals of patient decision aids is to really help people sort of anticipate what, what that health state is, is, is going to be like. We do have a question from the phone. Hi, this is Ellen Peters. I, um, I was really glad to see that you guys are thinking about the construction of preferences now within decision support interventions. Um, I'm curious what you think about, though, um, given the construction of preferences, how do you know? What, what kind of criteria can you use to know when a decision aid has done its job well enough? Yeah, so you know, there's a lot of interest in this whole idea of um, your decision quality. And, and how to measure decision quality. So, so the, the concept being that the patient makes a decision that's consistent with their preferences and values. Um, and uh, um, some folks at uh, the Foundation for Informed Medical Decision Making and uh, uh, Karen uh, Sapuchka at Mass General has been, you know, really trying to move the, these measures along. But, but that's what they're trying to do: is to get a sense of how well a person's stated values actually matches the, the decision that, that they make. Um, and there's been a few articles that are out on that, but I, I think that whole field is, is, is still, there's a lot of work to do there. Yeah, it's interesting because the construction of preferences would um, extend to values also, so it, it, it's an interesting conundrum. So I, I'm glad you guys are putting some effort into it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks everybody, and we're going to turn it over to uh, oh, I'm sorry. We actually do have another question before I turn it over to Paul Hahn. So I'm going to try to read it here from Larissa, who says, um, informed decision-making in the clinical setting, very difficult to achieve, lots of barriers, including time, concern about malpractice, et cetera. In treatment decisions, particularly in cancer, this is now becoming more acceptable. There are many decision tools available, but not disseminated in medical practices. Can... FIMDM, I'm not sure what that is. Can the Foundation for Informed Medical Decision Making make decision tools readily available to practices? Right. Um, so the um, the resources page that I included with the talk, um, there's a very nice uh, library of available tools at the Ottawa Health Research Institute. If you go to that website, you'll find an inventory. There is the uh -huh. inventory of tools. And uh, what's nice about it is, in addition to be able to, to get at these tools, they also provide um, the IPDAS checklist, an abbreviated form of the IPDAS checklist, so you can get a sense of how well it, the tool stacks up um, against, the, uh, against the current standards. Um, now, the collaboration and researchers in the field certainly recognize that the next frontier really is implementation and how to get these tools used in practice. Um, there's over, you know, we're approaching 100 randomized controlled trials of the tools, you know, done very much in, you know, sort of a controlled setting, and we have a sense of how they work, we have a sense of how, to, how they design them. The next frontier is really how to get these, these, these things implemented in, in routine clinical care. So, th so we are very much aware of that, and that's a priority for, for the investigators in the field. Thanks very much. Okay, now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Hahn, who's coming to us from the Maine Medical Center Research Institute, uh, but who was uh, here with us at the National Cancer Institute and has maintained his connections with us. He uh, was integral, uh, an integral part of putting this webinar together and of uh, just coming up with the idea to do it in the first place. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him to uh, do our closing remarks and perhaps uh, list some paths forward from here. Paul? Thanks, Kelly. And um, I want to thank you all for the chance to uh, participate in this. And uh, thanks to uh, Kelly and Gia and Bill for all your hard work in making this happen and to the National Cancer Institute. And I'm a bit cognizant of the fact that we're uh, over 4 o'clock. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep my comments brief, which is a hard thing to do because the, the afternoon has just been really terrific. And, you know, we, we've had really uh, the leading experts on these topics talking, and I know I personally uh, learned so much. So I want to thank you, thank all the speakers um, as well. So um, the, just to give you a little bit of background, this, this um, seminar idea started quite a while ago uh, when a number of people at the NCI recognized the need to take stock of the growing number of uh, risk prediction modeling efforts, both at the NCI and elsewhere, 
and to kind of think about um, not only the um, issues surrounding the goals and the content of these tools, but also the processes by which they ought to be implemented and, uh, for example, disseminated to the public. And so there's a perceived need to start thinking about identifying uh, areas for research, but also uh, potentially to see if we could define areas uh, where we could develop standards and guidance for both model developers and people interested in risk communication. So uh, these discussions led to a lot of thinking and, and desires to bring together uh, experts to really talk about these topics, and, and so that's where we are today. And again, it's been really gratifying, and, and I think it's been a great uh, learning session today. Um, I was going to try to summarize a bit of, of each individual uh, speaker, but I think I'm not going to do that in the interest of time, and, and I'm just going to cut to what I see uh, as some pearls of wisdom that we learned today uh, in the form of some uh, potential research questions for the future and questions that we might ask ourselves both as researchers and users of these models and in a way to try to connect the dots of some themes that I think we heard from, from several different speakers and that I think are really important. Uh, first of all, is, is a question really to risk modelers, you know, people like uh, Andrew and, and Mitch um, and others. And I think both uh, Andy and Mitch raised the point that the existing models certainly have issues in terms of um, limited accuracy and discrimination, particularly for use at the individual level for clinical decision making. So it raised the question, uh, as, as both Mitch and Andy uh, mentioned, of not only finding better methods to re refine and improve these models, but also it raises questions about what the standards ought to be uh, to decide when a given model with its particular uh, strengths and limitations in accuracy is really ready for prime time and, and when that model ought to be sort of disseminated and implemented. And I, I think that's an important question, particularly if we're talking about model use uh, for clinical practice. So, so that is a question I think that uh, I, I think we will need to wrestle with um, as a field. Then secondly, to, to risk communication researchers um, in particular, we heard a lot about some promising insights and best practices from uh, a few of the leaders in the field in terms of developing and studying risk perception and risk communication uh, uh, tools. Um, but I think there are uh, remaining questions about what, what are the best ways to uh, optimize the evaluability of risk information, as, as Brian put it. And, and again, we heard some promising insights, um, and I think we do have um, some sets of best practices, um, and we have empirical evidence to back that up, that uh, certain representational formats um, are optimal and certain contextual pieces of information are optimal. But I think there are also some, some unknowns there, and I think it will be important in the future to try to define what those gaps in evidence are and, and how we can move the field forward to figure out how we can actually make risk information more valuable. And I thought that was a nice uh, kind of unifying concept that uh, both Brian and, and Steve and Lisa uh, picked up on. And then thirdly, um, which was a, a question that I think all the speakers talked about to some extent, and also it was great hearing from Bob Volk representing the uh, decision support uh, community, um, and, and that is, do we need and also can we develop some reasonable standards um, and also processes to guide the development and implementation of risk prediction models? Thinking about kind of a, perhaps a similar uh, tack taken by the decision <laughs> community to try to come together and develop consensus on what some of the best practices and, and processes um, are. And so it's an open question. Would there be value for a similar type of effort uh, for risk model developers? But then I think um, Bob made me think about some questions that, you know, risk prediction models, uh, they certainly have several features of decision aids, and yet they're not really decision aids. They're, they're kind of in a, a, a middle status between simply a statistical model and a full-blown decision aid. At least the ones that the NCI and others have developed fall somewhere in between that, actually, and, and could be perhaps put to different purposes. And this is something, the purpose and, and goal of a tool is something that I, Brian and uh, Lisa um, talked about um, uh, really well. And I, I think that we have to ask ourselves, what are these things that we're developing? Um, how do we conceptualize them? 
um, again, being more than simply a statistical model, but less than a full-blown decision aid. And then I think that will determine how we really treat these. And then finally, um, kind of a major emerging theme that came out loud and clear in, in all the talks, really, is that uh, we need to have kind of a more nuanced, individualized approach to how we think about risk prediction models, given the diversity of applications to which they can be applied, and also uh, the different users uh, that they, they may be exposed to. And so whatever we think in terms of standards of um, evaluation and implementation, uh, we have to think about uh, there being some specificity to these things dependent on what the intended uh, purpose of the tool is and who the intended uh, users are. So uh, finally then, I, I think in terms of research to move the field forward, um, I think there needs to be both conceptual work that thinks about, well, what are we dealing with? What are these tools? And what are their purposes? And kind of develops, um, I think, a, a, a kind of systematic approach to conceptualizing their goals um, and uses. And then there needs to be more empirical work, both um, on the modeling end to improve model accuracy, uh, but also um, on the behavioral and communication end to figure out then how we can make uh, these tools more useful, make the information more valuable by patients, and also to think about, um, and this gets to the purpose of this whole meeting, at least from, I know from NCI's perspective, how can we promote more collaboration and team science, the, the things that Graham and um, Erica talked about a lot uh, with, with their successful tool? And how can we promote more transdisciplinary team science, um, such as uh, what, what they use, uh, to kind of uh, bring these communities together, um, hopefully to uh, create better models in general? So those are, uh, you know, quick, quick, fast overview of some initial uh, thoughts and questions uh, that I had. And uh, I, again, want to thank everybody for your participation. That's great, Paul. Thank you very much. So we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And again, thanks to those who put so much effort into making this happen, particularly Kelly Blake and uh, Energia Naranjo Rivera, who has been um, uh, making sure that everything works and is done in a timely fashion and asked a great question as well. Um, so thank you all. And if you have any feedback for us on future initiatives, future approaches we can take to, uh, to take all of this work in, uh, forward in a way that actually moves the science, we'd like to hear from you. So please take advantage of that. Any final comments from anyone? Okay, meeting right. adjourned. Have a good <laughs> afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for